Greetings, my good people. I'm here with a little bumper before the beginning of this podcast to tell you about why, first of all, I'm re-releasing an episode from April in 2021, where I spoke to the great Michael Tesserion. So a few months ago, maybe not a few months ago, not long ago, YouTube uh, removed this episode for some reason, citing medical misinformation. <laughs> It wasn't a show about health in any respect, so honestly, not even sure where that came from other than it seems like they tend to not want Michael Tessarion on their mainstream platforms, which I get it. He's pretty anti-everything uh, collectivism. So in this conversation you're about to hear, we talk about the Gnostic dogma, and I, one of the things I wanted to say to preface all this is... <laughs> I don't know if I even really have to say this, but a disclaimer, I'm not attacking the idea of actually knowing things, the spiritual gnosis that we talk about all the time on this show. Instead, we're really taking a swing at the whole pop culture, Gnosticism, the perennial philosophy of absolute victimhood that comes in the materialistic form as simulation theory, the fallen world, corrupt nature, demiurge evil God, God is actually the devil, all of that stuff, because it doesn't have any real foundation in true philosophy. And it seems to be more of a subversive uh, type of philosophy that who knows, you, you'll hear it. I'm, I'm getting to, too far ahead of myself. So we're putting this out as a full three plus episode for you, which means you're going to hear the second hour of this conversation that for the last three years has been behind the paywall of my rock or Patreon. And when YouTube removed this show, I had a thought that I really did want to re-release it. Just give it to everybody for free. In fact, it was one of the most popular shows I've ever done. And I, I don't think that this conversation is any less timely today than it was back then. So I hope you guys enjoy it and get a taste for what it can be like to be a plus member to Interverse and get the second hour and go deeper into the conversations. And... For those of you who are subscribers or may become subscribers, the archives are totally lit. <laughs> you know, go back. I, I hope you do go back as far as 2020, 2021. In fact, 2021 is a really special year in a lot of ways. Many of the friendships and collaborative partnerships that you see on the show regularly were formed, those friendships, in the year 2021. I think you guys we're probably all feeling the same thing as we were trying to glom on to anybody that had even slightly similar perspective on the world just to escape the the fear poison of the the normie realm right so uh check out the archives if, if you're newer to interverse most of this content is going to be eternally green evergreen <laughs> really good so I hope you do. Hope you go digging through. Don't go too far back, though. <laughs> Maybe I'm a little embarrassed about early, <laughs> earlier than 2020 stuff. But it's out there. If you want to see my journey, I've come a long way. And what else did I want to add on to this? Uh, I just want to give you guys a lot of gratitude for being here, showing up. And I hope you enjoy this plus free plus show with Michael Tessarion. It's very special to me. Back then, we were actually doing some work together. I helped him uh, produce some of his videos that he was doing for his website, Unslaved. So we had uh, a pretty tight collaborative relationship for a while there. We've since kind of dropped off of contact. <laughs> Back in my mind, I wonder if it's because like uh, I, I'm a little too radical. <laughs> I don't believe the earth is a ball, something like that. But I've got nothing but love for this guy who taught me so much. If I didn't have Tessarion in, in my learning experience through the formative years of being a podcaster. I don't think I would be as effective in a lot of the ways that I am, particularly surprisingly enough, the ability to do biofield tuning as well as I can do it <laughs> to tune people's auras, to find their stories, to tweak their psychological belief system, to remove limitations and put them into a sense of empowerment and health and coherence. I probably wouldn't be nearly as effective at that without the psychology side or and philosophy psychology philosophy michael tesserion he's the king of that stuff so yeah enjoy it and if you like it never oh never a bad idea to 
become a plus member. And if you're watching this on YouTube, this is just going to be a bumper that will lead you to check the description and go over to Rockfin is where I recommend watching it. It's totally free up there. Uh, it's not going to be a premium paywall thing and you don't even need an account to watch it. But if Rockfin's not your thing, uh, you got Odyssey and Rumble. We're going to have the video up there and we'll also have it on the RSS feed for the Interverse RSS feed. If that's something you're not following, might be a really convenient way to watch the show or listen to the show. Most of the uh, content is probably good enough without the video. So hope you're subscribed on the iTunes podcast app or your favorite podcast app of choice. And yeah, we're, we'll roll right into it. Hope you enjoy. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to jump over to one of those other channels so you can actually get into this meaty, philosophically logos infused masterpiece conversation i'll catch you guys on the flip much love Welcome to The One Within All, back to another episode of The Interverse. I'm your host, Chance, and man, am I excited about today's episode. For the last five years since being introduced to his work by a friend of mine, I have been following Michael Tesserion quite closely, and despite my best efforts, not even able to keep up with the mountain of research and content and material that he puts out there for us. Michael is a very amazing individual who probably no one in my life have I ever heard speak about selfhood to the degree that my own inner feelings about selfhood have ever reached. So uh, we're going to be having that type of conversation today about <laughs> philosophy, about selfhood, about collectivism. There's so many things on the table that we're only even going to be looking at a tiny sliver and fraction of the overall web of ideas that Michael puts forth on his channel, unslave.com, where for premium members, you are able to get hundreds of podcasts, lots of presentations on a variety of topics from conspiracy to philosophy and psychology. And probably the greatest thing about Michael's work is that he keeps the flame alive of previous thinkers who have already covered the ground that we're trying to get back to. As uh, an example, Soren Kirk Kierkegaard says, life is not a puzzle to be solved, but a reality to be experienced. And if that wouldn't help us out in our times, I don't know what would. <laughs> I could probably read about five different quotes I've pulled from uh, his book, his own words and other thinkers that he puts in there. And just for that fact alone, his books are worth reading because you'll get ammunition to <laughs> handle naysayers on any variety of subjects just through people who they might have seen as an authoritarian thinker by way of what the crowd says, having never looked into the individual's work themselves. But as Michael says in his book, Disciples of the Mysterium, which a lot of today's material will be based in, all that is necessary for the voyage of discovery to begin is the will to know. The rest comes in time along the way. <laughs> and the will to know has a lot to do with the questions of who am I and why am I here? These questions that lead us from the realm of problems to the realm of mystery. Mystery also being a clever way of saying my story, as opposed to being historical or hysterical. <laughs> and uh, really, selfhood is the goal here. So I, I will go ahead and get us started. Make sure you check out unslave.com for Michael's work. He has an awesome co-host, David Whitehead, who you may have seen on this program in the past. And self-love, the only kind of love there is, the ground of being, as Michael says, that'll be the biggest topic that hopefully we constantly circle around. And so I'm, I'm ready to get started. <laughs> That's my best introduction I can give of such a grand research collection. And I'm really glad to have you here, Michael. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks, Chance. I uh, really appreciate it. It's always good to talk to somebody who knows their stuff. And again, big thanks to you for helping with the premiums. Uh, the last whole bunch we've been doing has been, you've been in the control room helping with all of the technical side. And uh, Brotherhood of Death would be the latest one. People listening to this in the future, as soon as that premium goes up, four members, uh, you know, again, 
is largely because of your technical skill and help with that project. So it's great to collaborate as well as chat. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, those presentations have been really great for me because I'd be watching them anyway. I definitely don't mind lending yeah. a hand on the control room side. Brotherhood of Death was a very interesting one where you demonstrate the collusion between the, the royal powers and the Vatican in, the, in your homeland of Ireland, which I didn't mention, that's where you hail from. And uh, I think that that's really admirable work and difficult, probably, coming from your background to be looking at topics that the rest of your countrymen have been completely mind controlled out of even having as a possible thought experiment. Yeah, yeah. No, that's true. It's just uh, it started so early, that love, you know, of, of doing it, that we're, you know, so many years on now that it, it just makes sense. Uh, I think you and I spoke up before that see if you put a lot of energy into something like a piece of music or uh, any kind of a creative art. And, and this is creative art, what we're doing. It starts to own you. So per, it's very hard for me to talk about personal journey. It always was from the beginning. It's even more impossible now because it's not like a journey at all. It's like something is moving you. It, it, you know, it's not your will and saying, okay, you know, I can make a diary entry of all of this. It's like a flow, right? So in many ways, uh, despite the dangers and the other, not even so much the dangers of being you know, beaten up or uh, warned off or anything like that, that's, it's, it's just other difficulties of just having people that you think would be more supportive of your work turning out to not be supportive of it or you know, people in your family and, and other, so the, the other, and, and, even, and even in financial issues, you know, the work it takes means that you have to work part-time at, at a regular job and that's dead end. And then finally, after you give it up, you know, which is which is very, very troublesome, anxiety ridden years, you know, uh, and you're getting further and further away because then, you know, with the whole resume scene and everything like that, you know, you lose a job or you take time off, you can't so easily get back because they're wondering where have you been and you can't you can't open up and say, oh, I'm a conspiracy researcher, uh, researcher. I'm showing about shadow government and all to an average Joe, you know, person who's maybe a complete, completely horrified by that statement so there's there's a lot of other pitfalls in this movement you know it's because you can't go along with the mainstream and really do the kind of work i've done so it means that you're against the mainstream they don't leave you any middle ground they really don't so earning just earning a living in the, all of these things can become very 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 difficult but you're quite right if i had tried to stay in ireland and do this well they wouldn't you couldn't have done it jim cairns will prove that you know uh, other people who've tried it that's an absolute fact because on both sides of the spectrum you will be a pariah and you could you could easily fall foul of somebody who's taken you wrong you know and they're very violent so that, that could you end up in serious serious trouble by going down into any occult aspect of that whole troubles period yeah, yeah people but, in the united states are probably I mean, your research and even putting it out there is uh, most likely going back before the birth of some of our listeners right now. Yeah. And I think that many of even older individuals wouldn't realize if they're from the United States, just what the troubles were really like. I mean, that's a yeah. side tangent. You've done so much work on that. But the little tiffs we see in the streets here over this and that are nothing compared to the out and out carnage that was engineered in ireland yeah yeah over the over the many years there's you know literally thousands of people killed and even during the troubles which started around 1969 1970 of those thousands killed and they were killed in violent bomb attacks horrendous uh shootings you know people busting in your door running up the stairs you know and, and blowing your whole family away just because they and it might have been a very actually trivial thing actually you know sometimes there were warnings other times there weren't so Whole, whole tons just disappeared, you know, like Oma, for instance, you know, as we mentioned that, but Oma is just one town that had, a, you know, I remember waking up in the morning, or being wakened up, you know, feeling that the glass was going to go in of the house. And this was a bomb attack, you know, over two, three miles away, the, the utter impact, which just d devastate whole streets and whole communities. And one day, one time in the 70s, they blew up the gas works. And that just felt like Armageddon, you know, because it, they set a bomb off and, and of course gas explodes and stuff like that. So there was, there was sometimes right, there was bombs left in your street where kids right at the corner where kids played. I mean, almost like deliberately left where loads of kids kick the ball around and play at these little sort of halves or squares, 
you know, uh, massive Centex explosive bombs were left, and the army had to come and defuse them. And uh, yeah, frightening, you know, people were left out of their house for hours while they had to stand in the freezing cold at the end of the street, uh, you know, and you didn't know when you could get back into your houses. So it was like a kind of a war zone, something similar to what you might have in, say, Beirut, you know, because there's other hot spots in the world, obviously. But this thing just went on and on and on for the best part of 30 years. And then before the 1970s, there had been troubles as well. And terrorist organizations also were sort of like finding what footing they were really on. Some some were very radical left, and they moved to center. Others had been center, but moved more to extreme. Others were nonviolent, became violent. Others were violent and became nonviolent. So there was a tremendous move. I hope that came across in the presentation I did on it, because I wanted to give that feeling that these organizations never stayed consistent. You know, the terrorist organizations, they, they flux. There was a lot of flux. There were some groups that just never, went, you know, they were Republican. They were hardcore against the British establishment but they never endorsed violence. And then there was others who said, without violence, there's never going to be any change because these intractable royals or the intractable British government, without, you know, without some sort of uh, pushing back in the more violent way, they're never going to change. They own an empire all over the world, from South Africa to India to Pakistan. You know, they own this giant empire. They're hard to push around. We may be small Ireland, but we've got to fight violently. So you had your violent men come in, right? And that's uh, not something I, I support. Yeah, your you know, work I, really seems like important more than ever to keep other places from getting to that point. If uh, uh, enough of us shouting in the wilderness can help bring a little more selfhood to the picture. And uh, I think what's interesting is that at the root of this manipulatability of the minds of men is, uh, first of all, they think usually they're fighting for freedom or justice or something like that. You know, they're carried away with that idea, but they're uh, at the root, I think we've actually been divided in ourselves between body and mind. Probably the very first thing that is done by priestarchies of various stripes to get that key schizophrenia in, in, embedded in the individual's consciousness, which is the very beginning of playing the game of divide and conquer, of playing two sides off of each other. It starts within the individual. And so I'm going to quote. Disciples of the Mysterium, a book that I wish I'd read 15 years ago, <laughs> although I mm. think it's a book I could read many times in my life and, and see more. Uh, you, you say, to attain great understanding about life, we need only face the intelligible fact before us, namely that incorporeal minds do indeed exist within corporeal bodies. The self-evident coexistence of mind and body, which we irrationally insist on regarding as separate entities, is of paramount significance. It tells us something. So you kind of go on to explain the, the idea that consciousness is a gift given us by the body. And uh, I think that that's very interesting. I've never seen the dividing line between consciousness and matter. So right. that first key step, I think, is really important on the individuation path. Definitely. Definitely. In fact, you can't even really get off to the right start without it. Although we're living in a very Gnostic infused planet where you'd be amazed how seekers even after enlightenment or whatever still fail to get that right when they're quite far down the road and and it, and it can lead to a psychosis as it often does if you don't have it together you know because you have to have your feet on the ground and your head in the stars that's perfectly fine but a lot of people have their head in the stars or the clouds and they've lost their root and the root being the body but unfortunately, because we've grown up with religions that are deeply Gnostic, and I don't mean that in any positive sense, I think of that as an extreme pestilence of history and of consciousness, they've left that out. So, oh, and in many ways, the relationship with the body is so uh, you know, necrophilous that a lot of people's spiritual journey begins in order to get away from the body, if, 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 if you see that. So it's really bad. The spiritual journey they think they're on is actually, from its very start, something that is uh, unsustainable because it's some discomfort that they have being a self, being a body that's actually initiated the journey that they call spiritual. Well, that's, you know, and even history shows you that that you know, doesn't work. But unfortunately, all over the world today, you still have that. You still have a lot of people going into religions and ascetic paths. Uh, you have it in the West with the New Age movement. Uh, it's not all bad, but a, a great deal of this Gnosticism has entered in. 
you know, well-meaningly. There was a certain hermeticism, and, and probably there still is, but that's getting harder and harder to find, hermeticism being a more sound, positive, and body body uh, concerned, you know, sort of setting. Uh, I, I agree, like, with a lot of that. Say, like, for instance, to give a concrete example, you know, say Hatha Yoga, people will know what that is, right? Hatha Yoga, that, that to me is acceptable, you know, within limits, because it is body-centered. So... Whereas Raja Yoga and some of the other ones, you know, are not. They're, they're again, practitioners may not realize it until later on. But you see, along these paths, you need to be very, very astute. You need to be watching the path. You need to be asking questions all the time of these different yogic paths that you may join. Uh, people just turn their minds off. But, you know, when I was involved with a lot of this stuff, I kept asking questions. And I'm glad I did because it finally showed me the underbelly and these constant themes of world negation, earth negation. Um, life negation, actually, you know, if you go to the extent of, say, an Alvin Boyd Kuhn, Kuhn, one of those great names, then he's talking about the cult of mortification, the cult of asceticism, which is by no means a truly spiritual thing. It's actually anti-spiritual. And you, you and I have talked about it with the cyberpunk tarot, because whoever invented that tarot, whoever created it, and I actually mean the imagery of it, they are totally possessed with that kind of thinking, right? Their, their thinking is in every one of those cards almost an inversion, you know, of how I say the hermeticists who invented the tarot were thinking. So it's like a complete inversion. And we've explored that at great depth. And I know you have on your channel as well. Those cards really do just tell you the whole story of yeah. the process of, uh, you know, the opposite of individuation. What we see in society with this body, like body dysphoria, which is a subject that I'm sure we'll probably get into more later. Uh, is that, you know, you just have a bunch of people that are floating heads disconnected from a body. Yeah. How can you experience selfhood when the physical aspect of yourself is seen as lower or, or dirty or a prison, a cage? And I think the concept, one of the concepts that you brought out when, to me that I hadn't heard of before is the contrarium. You often have called it the hallmark of the creator. And I think this is an interesting segue because you might think of body and mind as a contrarium, as in in opposition. But what that concept philosophically shows us is that all of these opposites are, uh, and even the disharmony between them is actually a leading to harmony. It, it's originary disharmony that it is actually the grounds of being itself that without it, we'd have no reality to experience something along those lines is how I, how would you explain the, the contrarium? Yeah, just as you did. And uh, it's also, a, a, it manifests in consciousness as a kind of restlessness because the, you know, the description you gave is so deep. It's outside of our experience. We don't experience the contrarium as the contrarium, right? Uh, it's more theoretical, but obviously just to even get consciousness out of unconsciousness, and actually to get self-consciousness out of consciousness, animals are conscious, but they're not really self-conscious. Some animals are more than others, but basically the animal kingdom, nature itself is, is conscious and philosophically, but not self-consciousness. Human beings are self. Well, even to get that tripartite change presumes a kind of imbalance. But see, when we say these words in English, it immediately sets people off in a certain trend of thought. In German philosophy, it doesn't, they don't come out that way to talk about an underlying disharmony or whatever is by no means you know a statement that is uh negative it's understood as the flow of the geist or spirit you know just like when you walk right there's there's a pulsation there's a peristalsis uh and so realizing that realizing that so easily we can get fooled by the language these original german mystics who came up with the idea did try other metaphors you know, Jakob Bohm used the idea of, of a dark and a white light, which is very similar to the yin-yang, actually, concept. He tried metaphors. He tried to avoid devil and God, you know, all the traditional ones coming out of uh, that, because that was too extreme, because the contrarium is not just black or white in the sense of the way the Christians, because the Christians picked up on the contrarium uh, themselves, uh, but their iteration of it was puerile, you know. It was just an extremely evil God on one side, a deity, and a very good God on the other side. And it just makes no sense at all, right? So many, many traditions are based on this, but they're also based on a trying to get away from it. So these Jakob bombs and all, we're trying to find a 
go to the heart of Meister Eckhart. They were trying to go to the heart of religion and salvage what was important about it. Well, it didn't really work. You know, they fell, they were heretics. Later on, the German idealists, three, four guys, you know, uh, and five of you include Immanuel Kant himself, like a sort of proto idealist. They call him a transcendental idealist. Uh, they tried to salvage it too. Uh, you know, one more convoluted than the other in a way, you know, it, it, it's still in their attempts to salvage the truth of, of this particular aspect of metaphysics, some were more successful than others, right? And so that's where that study then begins. But yeah, in general, the way we, on the most practical level, we, ex, we experience it as by unit, you know, bipolarity or uh, polarity dualism, right? So all the dualisms that we know, and we also experience it as temperamentally as a kind of restlessness. So you're quite right. Although there is a unison, um, you know, although there are, uh, you could see, you couldn't have body and mind. They're so related. This is the strange paradox of things. One contains the other, right? In fact, mind doesn't contain body. Body contains mind. So there has to be, you know, a jigsaw-like unity. But at the same time, there's this underlying, you know, attention. And then that tension manifests not just in body and mind, but between left and right hemispheres of the brain. And, and everything, inhale and exhale, uh, you know, uh, joy and, and uh, sorrow, you know, and every man, and that's what Disciples of Mysterium was basically about. You know, it went off in other directions, but the main idea of that book was to just reintroduce, you know, in the modern age, this idea of the contrarium. It's not the word they used, but I really don't even remember where I got it from, but uh, it just seemed to me to be the right word for it um, to, to indicate that. So. So it's a necessary restlessness because without it, life wouldn't exist. Consciousness life is based on a disharmony. And this is the true Western mystical tradition. So any, all these other religions who try to frame it differently, you know, uh, are, are already deceiving you, right? So it was very, very important for me in Path of the Fool and everything I've done, uh, you know, in various articles and then what you're talking about, yeah, it, it needed to come out again so that we can have a reset so if people you know younger people today want to say i'm a bit wary i think there's been a lot of lies told in this movie. they're right it has so i was very conscious of that and so you know after 2009 or 10 when other projects like architects of control get out of the way and as i step more it was about 2010 we successfully did some very good podcasts you know on psychology it was a big relief because i'd waited you know god knows 10 20 years to, to do it so and i never forget it was during the time when alex jones's uh I think it was called the Fall of America or whatever his, his uh, program that came out at that time, that, that, that DVD. You know, I, uh, it was around about that time that then I, I did my first podcast on it. And right from the point go, it was very important to try and bring in this Hegelianism and this uh, German mysticism, you know, for people. Because there's so many detractors and liars, you know, they've been, I mean, Hegel is the, the number one most misinterpreted philosopher who ever lived. Everything people know about him you know, that he was a proto-fascist, he believed in the strong armored state and man subservience to this and the dialectic and all, it's all lies. It all comes out of a strain of left Hegelians, you know, who, who really are Marxists, right? And all they did was chop off all the metaphysics in Hegel, throw that into the dumpster and take a few of his, you know, minor writings on, on politics and then even, even inverted that, brilliant. But the metaphysics all went out the door, the stuff we're talking about now, that all went out the door because the dialectic, is his his commentary on, you know, the contrarium basically, you know. And earlier than that, you had Fichte who talked about the famous thesis antithesis synthesis. You know, Hegel never used those terms. It was a previous philosopher. So you know, the misinterpretation of that tradition is so egregious. So I've tried my best, you know, in in episodes we've done on Hegel and all the trying to straighten that out. You know, he may have used that term one time or something and it was borrowed it was just a common and each of these men had a different iteration then you know an explain an illustration of of how this process works uh, but the misinterpretation where did that come from you know there was a need by some forces to so drastically misinterpret these men must have been before a reason and i've always maintained this because they were talking the truth so later groups you know the positivists of england and the pragmatists of america and many other groups what we would now know as the cultural marxists or the critical theorists or the postmodernists those types the early version of that you know uh, were desperate to get people away from this german thought so you know i i i i, I like to teach and write on that so that uh, you know 
we can counter. Because the other thing is that all of those other paradigms have fallen. Right. Does not mean then that you resurrect the thing that you were attacking in the first place? It would logically, if we had logical people in charge, all the other materialistic and physicalistic paradigms have failed big time, you know, helped by quantum theory and helped by other things to bring it down. But still, unfortunately, that doesn't mean that we go back and dutifully resurrect the man where we you know, left off, the, the, the guy, the tradition that was truncated because the lie mechanism took over. Yeah, well, if the lie mechanism crumbles under its own weight, isn't it just right to resuscitate? That which was before, yeah, well, we haven't done it. So in my work, I'm one of the only people that goes back to that, you know, and says, well, okay, let's go back now before Marx, dig out those theorists and present them truly, you know. And you and I, we've just done that work, uh, well, back to back works, uh, Age of Dionysus and uh, the Moral Universe, exactly based on that paradigm, you know, to bring back to the body politic, to the Western tradition. And I think it's actually vital right now. I actually think especially for political thought, because this does have political ramifications. You know, it is talking about the state, but it's talking about the state as a manifestation of everyone's understanding that you're living out the process of Geist, right? That you are part of the journey of spirit. And this is what needs to be taught to children so that they're aware of it, to end their despair, to end their solipsism. It's just me alone in the universe, you know, or if you have deviant parenting, deviant teaching, there are certain philosophies in the West that were taught that no matter what, happens to you on that level, you'll never lose your mooring. And that's part of the reason why these John Deweys and others had to completely sabotage German thought, because it was so utterly spiritual, it was so deep. You know, it, it did it did sort of go around the byways, like with a Joseph Campbell, and it's it snuck into Freud and Jung, and that's all great and everything. But it, you can follow the trend, follow the trails that they left, and it takes you right back to the philosophers we're talking about. But had that been a pure iteration, right, including people Many more names than we're talking about, say, say some of the Alfred North Whitehead. He, had, he was a scientist. He brought in science version of this that, that destroys, I mean, quantum, because there's still a lot of physicalists in quantum science who refuse to accept what quantum science has taught them, right? So it, it, say, say some of these idealists, their work had not even been stopped, prevented, or warped. Uh, you, you, the vision that I have of what would have been in the West is so illustrious, so perfect. You know, that, it, that that's what emboldens me to continue against all the odds, because it really is something quite pure. You know, and that, that, this doesn't negate other philosophers or other philosophies, right? Because uh, I'm very synthetic. I can see the connections between a lot of these things. You know, uh, th th there's a lot of consistency with other non-idealistic philosophy. But the very fact that idealism itself has been so utterly misinterpreted, and even champions of it today, the ones running around calling themselves, you know, neo-idealists and all, they're not quite getting getting it right. I'm not that I'm not that you know impressed by a lot of uh, you know what they're talking about. It seems to be missing the boat, you know. Because uh, again, it's almost like they're focusing too much on the mind and not enough on the body, you know, and not much not enough on midwell, you know, which is the German word for society to reconstruct society. A, a good philosophy, you know, starts with philosophy, but it it works itself down right to the personal level. It in, it's inclusive. Yeah. The you brought up the mid wealth. I think that some of the issues with our thinking now is that we don't even have the vocabulary, like you pointed out with the needing to come up with the word contrarium and that some of the translations from German to English just have a completely negative connotation yep. when you're talking about disharmony or discord, which right. they meant to be actually just movement. You think about your legs. That's the duality that you run on, literally. Absolutely. I mean, it shows you right there. Your body is the template for everything else in the universe. So we, we see batteries the same way, requires polarization. We see that reproduction requires two distinct genders. And that's actually just the way things are generated here. And it doesn't. So if that's where life and existence comes from, how can the duality or the polarity be the enemy to be fought, you know? And uh, the occult, I, I think the occult is just advanced psychology and philosophy married together. I think that's really what you're doing when you study the occult. People have a different idea of that word, too, that it's black magic or it's something evil or satanic or something. And I mean, sure, plenty of occultists are satanic in the sense that they're adversarial to life. But that doesn't mean that learning about the deep element, elements of yourself and the psychology of the cosmos is in some way evil. It's actually the keys to liberation. You brought up Jung and 
as far as Gnostic writings go, he go, he's actually got the seven sermons to the dead, which is some sort of Gnostic in, in flavor, Oh yeah, yeah, but not really in a, to me, that one doesn't seem like a, a bad path for someone to go down. And what I like in his description uh, in that, in that story frame story is the idea of the pleroma, the all, which is the, everything that exists and its opposite, you know, in, in sort of negation leading to a state of void. So like the all is kind of also the same as void, a pure white light or a pure black light uh, or pure darkness. It's uh undifferentiated everythingness, but he, he talks about effectiveness being part of this pleroma or power or existence, you could say. And the opposite of that would be non-effectiveness, non-power, non-existence. So Whenever you do look at the whole grand scope of all the contrary elements and opposing forces of reality, at the end of the day, it leaves you with existence. Everything else it negates, but non-existence can negate nothing. Non-existence can't exist. It's <laughs> purely in our heads. And that would be a, that's something that people could get into in your work too, that existential philosophy, thinking about nothingness and how it changes our thinking. Uh, and so... Mm -hmm. Where, where you were starting to go, which I think is key, and it's a big part of Disciples, the book, is that most humans are caught in ideas about reality and in ideas about ideas. That is the most bombshell statement if you really stop to think about it. That is where we're separating ourselves from, from nature and from self is through this scaffolding of ideas that compartmentalizes and schizophrenizes <laughs> our, our psyche. Uh, could we speak about that as we kind of move into philosophy uh, as it is the foundation of, or should be the foundation of psychology, kind of moving in that direction? Yeah, sure. Uh, so that concept, the mysteria, right, uh, is just the word I use, mysterium for one, you know, and in the end it is one. It is one big illusion, right? Because the mysterium, singular, would be the ideas we have about ourselves like the one we just mentioned about right divorcing the body from a spiritual framework of understanding right there's mysterium but the thing is from that one then generates all the other mysteria that we find both in religion and politics and daily life you see so yeah and so what that does is it, it's really a it's a, it's a sort of a theory then or a philosophy of deconstruction because now you need to be continually doing apophatic work right which is the you know the next step here to get out of it, if, if, if your ideas have any kind of falsity, and it's not that they're all totally false, we're talking in a matter of degree here, uh, an idea could just be 1% one, 1 false, right, or 90% false. Uh, we, we've had a really good crash course in the last five years in politics to see this mysteria in action, right? Uh, but the thing is that then you'd need to adopt an apophatic methodology of being able to check your ideas, not just your ideas, but feelings. See, because there's a, remember the part of the contrarium is brain and heart, masculine and feminine, male and female. It's all around us. So there's a definite need to then have a more of an apophatic educational system that teaches you how to self-critique, and and also that that's very healthy. See, if if you heard that if somebody in the wrong heard that in the wrong ear, they think that you're talking about some sort of you know almost psychotic self inventorying, you know, to the point of obscenity. Well, think but about this real quick, that. Michael. People use the word like I'm too self-conscious as if mm. that means that they should be embarrassed of themselves or that, yeah, yeah. you know, that's a net in my circles. When people use the phrase self-conscious, they're usually referring to it in that negative sense, like as if that's not Definitely. desirable. Definitely. Yeah. I see. So you have to start at the root. It's very, very difficult. Ayn Rand is very important in all of this because she tries to champion heroism, tries to uh, delineate what it really means to be a self. So the word self is probably one of the most misinterpreted words. And that's where the, there's mysterium around that. Imagine it's like, you know, imagine it's like a bacteria or something like that gathering around a thing. There's more bacteria gathered around the word self than you could possibly have enough detergent to pour over it. But, you know, the journey still must go on because we stand on the shoulders of giants like Ayn Rand and Nathaniel Brandon and people like that. So the work has largely been done by these mentors. Ours is fairly easy. And then we have this kind of technology as well. So no matter how difficult things are, you know, in this journey, I've always remembered the suffering and the difficulty of the ones who came before. Uh, not all, some were, you know, you know, more well known and everything, but still they had difficulty because the, the world was against them, right? The critics were fierce, you know what I mean? So you just have to pick up their work.
But yeah, getting back to the question, the thinking itself has this ability to think about itself, right? We're, we're the only beings who can think about thought, think about what we're feeling, and double check our even feelings on that level as well emotionally. Uh, some people have even now neurologists are saying that feeling is the essence of all consciousness, you know, and they're, they're right. Uh, because what think what we call thinking is, right, the left brain mechanisms are really just instrumental to a deeper emotive uh, relationship with life, the attunement that's mood based. And because that gained in sophistication, other meant what we now know as the rational faculties came online. Right, but they overlie. They're just sort of emanations, more sophisticated, like a finer tools, you know, for doing surgery so that we can micro uh, analyze life, logic, discrimination, discernment, judgment, right? All those higher faculties are like honed instruments, but they sit over, right? They're like strata sitting over a much uh, deeper rapport, you know, uh, with reality. And this is then translatable into the right left brain, where the right brain would be the part of us, you know, in neurology that has that more um, omnidirectional access. I, I just call it, you know, in my work, uh, that it's, it, it is closer to what's the template of wholeness. Right? It might even be the template of wholeness. And the left brain has moved away from that into different interpretations. And there's value in that as well, because all consciousness is valuable to an extent. It's only when you take it to extremes. Now, through the bad education systems we've got, the left brain has been catered to, and therefore it is now the master that's, you know, used to be the emissary, as some neurologists call it, now it's become the master, and the, the other master, the previous master, the real alpha brain, has become secondary in consciousness, and it accounts for why a lot of things are wrong in our world. So, and there's different other ways of voicing that, you know, there's all sorts of different traditions but it is a contrarium, and now uh, the contrarium is something that's moving so much gel-like that it can actually polarize to total extremes, and then it can sort of, you know, come back like mercury on a dish. You know, it can sort of crash into each other, and there's there's eras and periods and times when, you know, there's there is a sort of a harmony, right? But that that harmony can also then be a kind of a deadness, right, in which there's no movement at all, and the polarity, which is terrible in one way, can also be a tension that's very needed for a sublation to take place. So there's no real you know, way of, of pull, passing judgment on this, both whether it happens in your own life in these moments. See, some people tell you, well, yeah, I had a breakdown. I almost went schizophrenic. And then later on, they're going, but well, it was the best time of my life because all the, all the lies died. Well, that's, well, that's what I mean. And the time when somebody's happy and three garages full of stuff and everything's moving, fast, they're, they're totally dead inside. So this is what I mean on the social and the spiritual level, spirit. The German idealists were trying to say the spirit has experienced this. Spirit, spirit is a very dynamic, you know, thing. And we needed to be taught the dynamics of this. Hegel was just a man who said, I want to stand up in the front of my class and teach this to children so that they're tuned in to the fact that when they have personal difficulties, right, depressions, miasmas, they're able to compute it in, in terms of the greater spirit. So they never feel alienated. Alienation, alienation was probably the most frequently word used by Hegel, right? You know, because they've left all this out, right? The things he really taught, yeah, well, you're never going to find out because they... They've gone off misrepresenting his work. But when you actually get back into what he was really talking about, it's something so utterly deep, you know, that uh, I'm afraid that, you know, as much as I love existentialism and other things, there's still a lot of really great gold to be panned out of these German thinkers, you know, that shouldn't have been left aside. And one of them is this concept of how to deal with despair, how to deal with depression. He, would, he believed that once you're united, uh, with your community, that everybody in that community has the same under spiritual understanding. Now, this was left the religion, and he knocked it. Right? He, he said there's some stuff that's okay there, but basically, it's so utterly the wheel had come off years ago, and no, it's it's left it's left civilizations, it's left cultures in the ditch. And then that fact, in in a, you know, like I say, the bacteria that get, gathers around that, then brings us into these Nietzschean despairs. Right, God is dead. You know, so he's he would if if he had lived in our time, he would have looked back at the, at the de God is dead period and all of that futility and pessimism of existentialism and laughed at it. He said, "I know where that's all coming from. You guys needed me, you know, because I could have told you that when you went off into the ditch, it's like rust gathers. So all the traditions that he saw of the postmodern world, or if, if he would have saw and probably did foresee some of it, 
is this decadence, the nihilism of Nietzsche and others, he would have been able to account for why it's there. Because the, the real understanding of the thread of life has, has disappeared. And I make it simple in my work to just say that there's the stereotypical, you know, the, the sort of mythical archetypal, and then the real spiritual logoic movement underneath. And that if you're in this, most people in the stereotypical have lost all insight into, you know, the connections between these three cogs. And that the, the Hegelian teachings and all were to make you very, very aware. Okay, that it was a little bit preserved in Joseph Campbell. They did great work. Carl Jung has done great work. It's not that it was totally lost to the West, but to all intents and purposes, it was. And therefore, now you're trapped within just the stereotypical level of existence, myopic, one-dimensional, linear, uh, you know, Apollonian. And then the rust that gathers then becomes science, scientism. You see, all of these things can be understood as going wrong because you're disconnected now from the mythical and even something even deeper than that, meaning you've lost the sensitivity because you're not being taught it. You've got John Dewey, you've got education, you've got all the foulness of it. And so the midwell will start to corrode, right? Hegel was very, very worried. He wasn't talking about any draconian state or, or this nonsense that they're teaching you that he said. He was worried that the infections within, you know, the midwell within society would happen because the spiritual underpinnings of it has been lost or misrepresented or just handed over into the hands of religion. And that's just a temporary self. There's, only, there's echoes of, of truth in religion, but the religious mind has become itself poisoned you know through hierarchical control or whatever you know the whole thing we know all about just this supernaturalism I, I think that's yeah. one of the biggest points that teachers like yourself and and a few others that i've uh, run into like actually last week's guest clint richardson we had a little tangent about that very state that very word supernatural how can something be beyond or above nature and there really can't be it would just be mm. a part of nature we haven't discovered there is nothing beyond existence or beyond reality. That's the whole of it. I think that that's word, mysteria. that's mysteria. Yeah, because you have people that would rather talk to you about, you know, out of body experiences and other dimensions and, and aliens and outer space and all these. I mean, even the very idea that reptilian overlords are manipulating us and, uh, you know, farming us as some sort of psychic food source is, in my opinion, it's just like a, you've just basically outsourced your own reptilian brain and that own base part of yourself and put it on Zeta Reticuli. Yeah. And instead of examining it as a part of you and getting real about it, now it's an external force through which you can blame your problems. And uh, I mean, pick your flavor. There's plenty of externals mm -hmm. to blame your problems on. I, I think that that's a, a really wild thing right now that we're seeing more and more like acceptance of the uh the aliens idea as we are ramping up to a one world government that needs a different type of other perhaps to hold itself Definitely. together mm -hmm. yeah yeah it doesn't negate that aliens did indeed visit this planet at one time but the thing is that uh, that that theory can be used in wrong hands or by a psychologically basically a uh, remedial person who indeed does exactly what you're saying you know, and it wouldn't be the first time that the heavens, you know, in all caps, was used as a projection screen for the psyche. In fact, that's how even astrology comes online, actually, in, in more of a positive sense. Uh, and you're quite right. You see, look at the ecology movement with your, I'm thinking more of the Al Gore, because right? again, within ecology movement, there's a very sincere voice about loving animals, loving the planet. It's not that, but it's been used in wrong hands, in which the whole of the idea of climate has, has exactly, as you say, been uh, used as a psychic processor, right? It, it, the inner ecology, the inner climate, the psychic climate is, is in peril. And so instead of dealing with that directly and, and holistically, we create mysteria, right? Which is you project the idea of the idea out there and you become fascinated by that idea uh, and uh, you go off into complete irrationalism. See, Ralph Ellis is a much more unbiased climatologist or thinker can show you there of your ways, but nobody's listening any more than they are listening to the tens of thousands of doctors now about the pandemic. Uh, nobody's listening, but don't they have medical degrees? I mean, Bill Gates doesn't, and all the people telling you to wear your mask don't in the city street. Oh, we prefer if you wear a mask, well then move away and you won't have any problem. Get out of my sight if you don't feel secure and safe. No, but we'd feel better if you wore it. Yeah, but then that feel better culture and that argument of, uh, I have to do something to make you feel better can be used across the world to destroy the world. 
you'll easily feel better if you piss off out of my way and then you won't be having a problem. But those who fold up to that rhetoric, oh, I have to make you feel better. I have to make your emotional, I am responsible for your emotional setting. You're not, you just stand right there claiming you're going to be infected by me and you're incapable of seeing your own mental process, how irrational it is. In fact, irrationality has been normalized now, you see? So this is the mysteria that I talk about in Disciples. It just, it just, it just exponentially gets created. How are you going to keep your focus, right? And I love all of these subjects that you're talking about in as of themselves as subjects. They bear thinking about there's within there some very important stuff. But when you're using that as a sort of a foxhole in which to dive because reality itself has become, you know, you're, you're in this reality. Well, now, yeah, you can be into all sorts of boogaloo things. And unfortunately, this movement does indeed, you know, attract a lot of people like that who are, for one reason or another, looking for, you know, one of these uh, platforms that has attracted them. But again, they're not using that self reflect They just they just become fans of it. They just, they just move in on a sort of one-to-one -one level without critiquing it. The apophatic aspect isn't there, which is what you need when you're doing my work. Everything I say has been double, triple critiqued. And I mean, in a very sincere way, in a very desperate way, where, you know, my own life changed because of it, looking deeply into things I believe or what I've read or what somebody else is telling me and all of this. And we should have had that. You know, I wasn't taught that. I just had it naturally. But we, we needed something that, you know, does teach this to children and makes them read your Sherlock Holmes as, you know, and the Conan Doyles and all of that and, and becomes very uh, deconstructive because it's out of that mud of deconstruction that the most perfect sunflowers grow. And we've lost that in the West. We've lost any concept of what we're talking about here. It all has to be instant. It all has to be stamp approved by MIT or somebody else. And it has to be sort of, you know, physicalistic without, see, because we call it. And well, politically people, correct. People Let's say, just throw politically correct in there too. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Big time. Or somebody would say, sure, Michael, all scientists do what you're talking about. You're just making a lot of hair, but no. Science is at deconstructiveness, but it's not. It's not. Scientism is a paradigm. Scientism is already like even you know Thomas Kuhn, the greatest of scientists, have already critiqued it. Not me. They said, "Watch out for the paradigm. Once you've bought the paradigm and you're in it, you think that you are then you know the one who's got the great uh, 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 gauge of knowledge. You know the big the big the magician's wand where you are seeing the world clearly. No, the paradigm has already shut you off from reality. Your materialism is the is the worst vantage point to be on, and it's just you within it." sitting at the wheel saying, I have complete vision. Well, how would you know? You have an object, because the whole point of a Heidegger in these people is, no, you're not objective. You don't even know what objectivity is. You're living in the word again, like we said earlier, right? People live in the word and the word becomes the reality. So the scientist has heard somewhere that we're, we're objective, everybody isn't. And without thinking about it for another second, just wheels out that same you know, piece of rhetoric. We're the objective ones, you're not. Oh my God. So Charles T. Tart. He's wrong. Ian McGilchrist, Sheldrake, Michael Cremo, they're all equally degreed, if not more than you, and they don't agree. You see, so you have to marshal your facts. You're up against a paradigm, and that paradigm does not self-reflect. That paradigm does not go lightly, isn't humble, right? It becomes, it becomes completely institutionalized, and then it asks you to conform. You know, it's like there's no letting, there's no leeway. There's nobody from the outside. It's like you go into your medical doctor today and say, you know, I don't like your whole edifice. Your edifice is so powerful that I know what's in your head, mate. I know you're probably a decent guy. You don't want to hurt anybody. But unfortunately, you know, you are hurting a lot of people. You can get in a conversation like that with the average doctor. Uh, what I've said is just right. All that big pharma and all that industrialist-ism behind him is his brain. There is nothing left for you to talk to that will go, yeah, you know, you're right, you know. No. And, and you could send him all the Dr. Mendelssohn books and all the naysayer books of MDs 10 times you know, degree than he is. It won't make a difference. He'll never change unless something personal happens in his life where, you know, uh, but that's out of your control, isn't it? If, some, if he goes through a rite of passage where somebody he knew died from, you know, iatrogenic mishandling or from malpractice, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe that person will change. But you can't plot that. And, the, and as much as you want, to say, I'm going to challenge you. You know, I don't like what you people do here. You murder people. You're you're a death cult. You you really imagine that you're going to get through any of these people in England because it's NHS, whatever you know, the NHS. It, you don't pay. So in America, where you can actually you can actually fight the system through lawyers. You know, if malpractice was done, 
In England, you can't because it's NHS. You don't pay. It's part of the national service. What, what, what that has done is created an immunity of these people. They can do anything they want now and do the most egregious experiments and things like that. And you have no recourse. No lawyer will touch you. They go, sure, you got that for free. You know, it's, a, it's part of the white ritual, right? And you're going, well, what's the difference there? Oh, well, the, you know, they didn't do anything wrong to you. So they got the setup legally where you cannot do anything to the NHS, no matter how bad the service was or who died on the surgery table or who died from a vaccination or medi you know, medical. They've got a very, very system because we're, we're, the we're the benevolent, humanitarian, untouchable. Try fighting us now. Try telling me that I did wrong. I'm the doctor. See, so we have created edifices through faulty thinking that are now gaining extreme institutionalized power over us, like your Michel Foucault, right, the total institution, like your George Orwells, and even insiders like Huxley, who are part of it, warned you. Watch out what you're creating for yourselves. He very subtly, very beautifully, you know, very uh, in a very sophistic way, tried to warn you that you're bringing this about. And so I carry on their message that any kind of draconian big daddy or big mama, whatever form it's going to take, we are actually in many ways living in the shadow of it because we have conjured it by not listening to truth. When you don't listen to truth, when you don't occupy the white squares of knowledge, somebody else will. And that's exactly the dynamic. It's as old as the hills. No matter what age or epoch, you could be in the Roman Empire, and this is the way it works. Yeah, brilliant, man. I'm thinking about how the left brain, right brain contrarium, if you will, can be looked at as focus as the left brain zooming in on one compartment of reality versus the peripheral vision, the wholeness. Sure. And psychiatry, even med just medical practice in general, it's focusing on these parts without the wholeness aspect. Uh, Definitely. As you say in your book, psychiatry is a lot like, or psychology, psychiatry is more of the, you know, drugging people up aspect, but psychology emphasizes the imperfections of man by zooming in on these, you know, from this left brain focus perspective, or without philosophy involved to give you the whole picture, as you say, something along the lines of philosophy is uh, concerned with the perfection in reality, the wholeness, right? So when uh, to actually quote you from this book, you say the harsh but certain fact is that without a rational vision of ourselves as perfect beings in a perfect universe, the tireless noteworthy efforts of psychologists and psychiatrists to diagnose and, and mend mental and emotional dysfunction will, like the activities and aspirations of politicians, and also let's just add doctors in there, ultimately lead us nowhere. And I think that that is a, a really brilliant thing to take into ourselves that that our, our focus will always see imperfection when we look at just a piece. But without the, the peripheral vision of wholeness, then we wind up with the hundred years of psycho institutional psychology that we've had where society is more messed up than it was when we started on that. And there's more suicides and more um, you know, depression and a whole list of brand new things to diagnose that never even existed in the past. And some of that is also pharmaceutically based when it comes to things like mental derangements in the realm of Alzheimer's and autism. But what is interesting is all of this sterilized, <laughs> you know, me medical, medicalized doctors as the new priest class direction that society has gone in. It reminds me of the film Zardoz that I would have never heard about without you uh, bringing it up in one of the old podcasts where you talked about films. And this is, uh, it's John Carpenter, am I right? Uh, John Berman. John Berman. Oh, I always mix up the Johns. Thank you. Uh, Zardoz is this film about a, a perfect society and just how dead they are <laughs> on the inside and right. just how sterile it is and how nothing happens. And it's a perfect example of the uh, stasis of perfect harmony and the uh, sort of evil in that because it only exists if there's a, a collective idea of what that perfect harmony is and everyone adheres to it, right? So... I think that uh, I'm not sure where I'm going with this other than I think we're, where we're at right now in both the new age or, or even in Gnosticism with the ideas of archons or in the way a lot of people interpret psychology is that, oh, we can just blame the unconscious or we're the victim of some unknowable numinous force that has entered in and influenced us. And I think all of that comes from being just focused in on uh, focus and not seeing the the periphery of of self mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and 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 an adjunct to that statement about imperfection, right? Looking, honing in, and all of that. The the holism the holism involves our view of imperfection. I'm not saying that you know it doesn't exist or that you should focus in it or the whole view even sees the background for an imperfection correctly, right? So you don't erase. So this is where the left brain went wrong, right? And the right brain's encompassment even sees imperfection as you know the grain of sand and the oyster that created the pearl. So that's what we're talking about, the contrarium. Both sides of the contrarium are equally right and wrong. So it cancels it out. It's beyond good and evil. It's something ontological, right? And it's only the left brain's myopic idea that goes, that's imperfect. We need science and pharmacology to fix it. So you know, we need to put earrings on the Mona Lisa. It wasn't perfect as it is. you know. And so there's a part of our brain, this little gremlin, that runs around doing that. Now, in Zardoz, of course, that's all, sci that's all about scientism. That was a film. It was beautifully done to show that what would happen if we really did have a utopia in exactly the way that the scientists and these other sort of Apollonian types, you know, uh, keep advocating. And politics is also a huge part of this because they're yeah, always Huxley talking about and scientific dictatorship. Yeah, basically. Right. Isn't it? And in that film, they're also talking about improving life and living forever. And then they end up actually finding it. So Burman sets this movie in the future. It was filmed in Ireland, actually, County Wicklow. That's why it's so beautifully filmed. Um, but his thesis there was that what happens if these guys, just let's imagine a community, you know, someone like Logan's Run or whatever, that they kind of do get this, you know, it's been ripped off by tons of other films later on, right? Uh, but this was a little low-budget version, and it's really, really good because it, it does show you that what happens if that perfection that scientists and, and, and the, most of the world even signing on unconsciously for it, the man in the white coat, gets his reality. So the beautiful thing of that film was then it's a deconstruction of that. It's a sort of a Nietzschean think about what would life be like in that perfect dome? You know, Blake Seven, uh, certainly the pilot, is a, a fantastic, uh, almost, almost a, you know, mind-bogglingly brilliant uh, take on that because in, in, in Blake Seven, the idea is you've not only got the perfection of the perfect community, you've got the police dragon, you know, the police dog force that takes out the man who, in their eyes, goes wrong, he, something breaks. You know, they don't even... They, they, they don't even they don't even see it as real uh, revolution or renegade. They don't they don't see it as sane, spiritual rejection of their system. It's just a fault in the in the glitch, a glitch in the matrix. And in that particular case, they call him a pedophile in order to you know demonize him and, and have him executed or something. While you know they bring up this whole thing about accusation, which I always think was as actually a fantastically prophetic, you know, way of getting rid of you by t telling you you're sexual deviant and concocting a lot of your lies. So that everybody just finds you guilty. And by the way, even in the court case that finds Blake guilty, there's nobody actually finding him guilty. It's a machine. Yeah, they put these two globes on this, you know, sort of like what looks like a stylized uh, justice. You know, the scales of justice. It's it, they put the computer files there, and he just has to wait to go guilty. You know, it's like it's, it's so inhuman, and you can't fight back or anything. And we have that now with online censorship. It's just the uh, algorithm. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And even his own lawyer goes, you're guilty, you horrible person. I'm not defending you anymore. And he's going, come on. And then the whole series begins with this travesty when he's sent to this fucking prison planet. And there's an enormous uh, spiritual, uh, you know, aspect to the next episodes where the, he gets, he gets uh, freed by accident by way of a computer ship called the Liberator. And the ship is organic. So they get on there as kind of pirates. They're, they're sort of like almost like invaders, like uh, bacteria. But the ship, this is, a, this is so beautifully done, right? Is it a ship or is it something more? Reads their deepest unconscious. These banditos who get on there, you know, the ship, four or five of them. Well, the ship computer, so to speak, reads their deepest fears, deepest subconscious level to see if they're truly good people or not, if they really are moral or not. And, and it kills immediately. It destroys anyone that is, you know, immoral by bringing up images in the, you know, in front of them of their past. So it does it to Blake and the people who will become his crew, and it finds them worthy. So they survive, and in the end, they actually are able to escape. You know, the bondage of the planet Earth. They they get saved from their servitude through this ship. You know, so it's all a psychological symbolism. You know, of the the repressed function, and it's all this Jungian stuff, and even even more than that, an extraordinary uh, an extraordinary comment on the unconscious 
you see so the idea being that the secret of your own liberation lies within your own being you know and that uh, the more and more people want to shy away from that the more and more they'll go for an imposed kind of order and live in the dome you know like falls foul of it but you know everybody else is completely conform they say that the suppressants in the air just in case anybody should break you know because there are the, the you know the frankfurt school and all these kinds of people they know that we're you know we do have pangs and we're not emotionally balanced and they know there's criminal fallout and delinquency and child delinquency and all sorts of aberrations so they're working on how to level all of that out so you have al gore with his ecology thing you know talking externally about something that's psychological now you get bill gates talking about vaccinations and biological unhealth and disease to awaken paranoia from within to awaken well to awaken the simplest way is again i displace to biology you already sort of, sort of said it you i displace to biology the worries that are really psychological and thank you bill for helping me talk now and process and think about right my deep emotional plague but in, in framed nicely in mysteria because that's exactly what they've done and he's by no means the only one who's done this this has been wheeled out again and again and society's complicit in it i think a lot of people are sad that the you know the lockdown might even end uh, and again you can always blame somebody else you can always blame bill gates or george soros he sees there's this other dynamic involved in which in the process of making a thing left brain thought you know bringing it to the ego level of thinking there's also a lot of um projection and blame so that you're exonerated you know of any kind of blame so politics is a very you know uh, well how do we say it in one of the programs when you have no actual responsibility for that self all caps you vote <laughs> or you do charity or you become a philanthropist and if you're very very rich you become a super you know you become bill gates but even if you're not that big well you'll donate to you know battersea dogs home or you know the, the poor starving guys in somalia or whatever all of this is nonsense right it's because you're actually uh, wanting to still prove that you're responsible you've abnegated completely uh, psychological responsibility in the deepest sense of the word but your ego knows you've done that and is drenched with shame over it so uh, quickly you look you know to look good in the eyes of the world and that's how I see this shallow, hollow. I'm not against charity by any means, but I, I, I can tell the fake version of it when somebody is in a deep state of compensation and displacement. That's not good. That's not going to lead to health. Very important thing to realize that a lot of what passes for altruism is really just masking mm. uh, a need for someone to take care of themselves first. I mean, we hear that platitude all the time. You can't give from an empty cup, but that doesn't just because we hear that as a Thing that people say all the time doesn't mean we really truly integrate that in some in our being and it, and act from that there's so many new ways all the time that you can discover the self-sabotage that you've done in the name of looking good for others i mean nobody is immune to this we've all been implanted yeah. with the seeds of this and it might be core to our very being or or it might be something that's been exaggerated by ancestral trauma as you bring out in your work uh how much of a factor that is in, in everything that we've seen throughout the development of what we know of as history. But we are at the uh, end of the first hour, starting to run a little over. Really glad we talked about Zardoz and Blake Seven. Those are, I'll link those in the show notes, as well as another one you turned me on to, The Prisoner. I watched all three of those and yeah. phenomenal older works, lower budget, yeah. but high yeah. brow on the, uh, the oh, intellect yeah. side. Stories, Incredible work. Stories are really good. But before we wrap up, tell people about uh, where they can remind people where they can find your work and, and the scope of it a little bit. And also on your website, we've got four shows together where I've covered uh, virtual unreality, my examination of occult symbolism in video games and the Gnostic seeds that we're going to be pointing out more in hour two. Yeah, that's right. We've done that on, on the slave .com where the podcast is and you're right you've been on and you will be again um michaeldesign.com for articles uh, i have about 14 different websites so you can get to them all through the main site of michaeldesign.com there's all sorts i like to modulate everything so it's less confusing so all the different sites i have can be accessed by michaeldesign.com and that's also where the articles are free interviews you know that we've done as well uh yeah so people can come there but uh the premium content that you've been helping me with is also on onslave.com. Yeah, it's, it's really good stuff, guys. It's been crucial 
if you think that I ever sound like I, I know a thing about a thing or two, a lot of things that I've learned came from information that Michael turned me on to. And, uh, you know, it's uh, the great teacher is the one that can show someone, help them see how to think, not tell them, tell them what to think. Right. Oh, so yeah. I appreciate your work greatly. And, Thanks um, for acknowledging it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I feel like it's a duty at this point. It's criminally underrepresented, underrepresented, especially considering the scope of it. So I hope to uh, make a dent in that and keep working together to do that for as long as we can, because yeah. uh, these ideas are always going to be crucial to our higher uppercase self, not a higher self, but the self in our of our core, not some mystical separate entity, but the uh, the holy guardian angel within, you could say. Right. But That's it. Let's move on to the second hour. I've got some really fun stuff about simulation theory and Gnosticism to get into. And man, we bear, we probably, in terms of uh, Disciples of the Mysterium, maybe covered 5% of some <laughs> of the ideas are, that are in that book. If we, we maybe got that far into it. So that that's just one of his books, guys. Check it out. And uh, everything's linked in the show notes. And, and thanks, Michael. Yo, you're most welcome, Chance. Let's do it again. Right, guys we're going to flow back into this conversation as quickly and easily as possible <laughs> the uh, material i had in mind for the first half of the show i think we got through about half of that so we're gonna move a little bit away from the philosophy we were discussing although i'll see what i can weave into uh the second hour from that and i want to get into gnosticism because i run into this all the time when i work with other content creators, other people in this um, community, so to speak, that whether it's from the new age perspective or from the ideas that others have heard the, uh, heard about Gnosticism and probably not their own reading themselves, we have the seeds of this world as a cage, this demiurge concept, uh, an evil, malefic creator god. And they, they seem very hard to root out and even when I do my best to point out the the fallacies in, in these belief systems, wherever I see them, it still doesn't quite quick click for people that maybe the entirety of the mysteria is, uh, is uh, something that we need to maybe be rooting out. So I wanted to just get you to flesh out this idea of what Gnosticism is in terms of what we see it as in society, not necessarily condemning any specific Gnostic text, specifically like the, uh, the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, incredible, incredible wisdom to be found in some of these writings. But it's more about the ideas that people have about ideas that are really hurting us right now, that individuals that are parroting and they're just interested because it's edgy and it's maybe anti-Christian saying that the Christian Jehovah is actually the devil. And uh, yeah, it's all supernatural and <laughs> Can can we get a bit of a, an overview of what you see as the Gnostic roots or seeds in our society today? Maybe like just a little overview of that concept. Oh yeah, you mentioned the Stefan Hollers. You know the seven. Was it the uh, the young thing? Yeah, seven, yeah, that one. Seven, seven sermons, sermons to, the to the dead. Yeah, so that was a book that uh, was like a Bible for me. You know, back in 1990 when I came across it. So I studied it all the way through. So any comments that I make about Gnosticism, I actually start studying it back long before that, actually. But it really ramped up the year I got to the States. You know, we have access to more of the books. And also there was a sort of a heyday at that point. Um, there was just so many books had been published on the Nag Hammadi Library. It was about 40 years of deception from the papacy that kept the lid on uh, the Gnostic Gospels anyway. <laughs> Right, and that, and that just like put a huge kibosh on people writing about it. Uh, so you'd have Elaine Pagels, Gillis Crispell. You know, uh, we're doing a lot on Enslaved about this. 
whole series. We've done we've done one good podcast on it, dealing with Alvin Boyd Kuhn, one of the big critics. So I'll throw out that name right there, because I am a critic of it as well. But I understand it from the inside, right? And everybody is a Gnostic. See, anyone who like all Christians are Gnostics, all Islamic people are Gnostics. All uh, what do you got? Judaism is basically Gnostic, right? To to all intents and purposes. If if I took off the, if I didn't say this was Saint Paul's letters or, or, or you know Acts of Saint Paul, I, I took that off or I took off you know the term epistles or whatever and read it to you. If you had been stud- if I told you study Gnosticism for ten days and then I'm going to read you some passages, and it was the works of St. Paul, you would say that's Gnostic, you know, even though Christians with a cognitive dissonance just simply refuse to believe that. So the point I'm making is that all religion is basically, if it's not 100% Gnostic, it's littered with other elements. Now, on the positive side, because you talked about not condemning, that's correct, because you can't have Gnosticism without infusion of Hermeticism. So, you know, we're going to talk here about the right way to see these things. So, Although religion is infused with Gnosticism, and there's nothing good about that, Gnosticism is infused with a lot of Hermeticism, and there's a lot of good about that, because that's what it really is all about, right? This body-centered, it's uh, earth-centered, it's inclusive, it's right-brained, it's uh, working closely with the nature's orders, you know? So it's, it's, it, Hermeticism is based in the opposite ideas of Gnosticism, but Gnosticism being so thin in and, in and of itself that many of its teachers uh, find themselves sort of, you know, uh, pilfering, you know, with one eye turned, but they're they're pocketing, you know, a lot of hermeticism because to beef it up, to beef up their Gnosticism. And then over the centuries, you know, since the time of Alexandria, so many hermetic elements got in that some of the great hermetic, some of the great Gnostic commenters like G.R.S. Mead of the Theosophical Society and others, and even Stefan Haller, they, and Manley Palmer Hall, they're talking as if they're conflating the two. And, you know, often they don't, uh, more often than not, they're not explaining the difference because they don't know the difference anymore. So my work brings something unique, and that is that, look, there are Druidic elements, there's Aryan elements, there's Hermetic elements in Gnosticism. And unfortunately, since it's all cooked together, it's not so easy to pluck out, you know, those ingredients because the dish has already been cooked. But what you can kind of do is train yourself to notice the Hermetic elements and be aware of them. That's the study. You know, and I uh, met uh, somebody as soon as I got to America. I ran into somebody who had uh, been studying this stuff. Uh, I didn't even realize that anybody other than myself, you know, took an interest. So we ended up having a lot of conversations about it, and it really honed my own because I'd been studying it, you know, inwardly, mm-hmm, you know, thinking about it inside yourself, but never actually for the first time in my life ever getting into an open dialogue. And that was really transformative because it helped. It basically helped me. At a, at a key point, because there's elements of me that sort of leaned, you know, I was already a part, a part of a path, an Eastern path at that time, that was one of these paths that was very Gnostic in its, in its essentiality, pretty much in one way, I would say they had no hermetic elements. It was like, you know, very, 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 uh, and I was even involved in satellite groups that were sort of the same. So in many ways, Gnosticism, I was like a devotee. I told you that Stefan Holler's book there, you know, was like, I was eating it up. I was like, this is fantastic, you know. And then went through other later stages where I was able to go cold turkey from that and change and see the flaws. By no means something that happened overnight, right? You know, because Gnosticism enters into Christianity, maybe in the form of even St. John of the Cross, uh, Teresa of Avila, right? There's, there's lots of trends there. There's lots of study there. But then there's the study of a thing without yourself being totally involved. You know, as you become more detached and you become a little bit more wary and you start to discern these hermetic elements. So hermetic teachings were very, very big in Egypt. They're basically hermeticists in Egypt, not Gnostics. Uh, and then by the time that Egypt had long fallen, and you get the city of Alexandria, it becomes very synthetic. Uh, you know, and then these sort of, uh, there's a whole bunch of elements coming together. And it's like salad, you know, it got shook up again and again many times, you know until you get this kind of Gnosticism, and it's so blurred, you can't even tell whether, you know, whether the real Gnosticism is more ancient than, than, than Christianity, or is something that weird hybrid that came after Christianity, you know, is it, is it not only had Judaic elements, 
but as it tried to separate from Judaism around St. Paul, or you have difficulty discovering there's lots of Ju there's lots of Gnostic elements in raw Judaism. Even if you don't even factor in Christianity, Judaism has a Gnostic element. Yeah, but well, Judaism has a lot of uh, Judaism is a manifold religion. The Jews can't even work out who they are. It's like there's 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 Persian elements, there's Gnostic elements, there's Hermetic elements, there's esoteric, there's Kabbalism, which has a bloody goddess tradition secreted 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 within it, right? Uh, and then there's Gnostic elements. So you really have to sort of, to really understand Gnosticism, you got to sort of, you know, bracket Christianity and actually make a study of Judaism, which very few people have ever done. You know, I've studied the actual history of Judaism. I know actual things about it. You know, most people don't. It's so pathetic. And there was a couple of times in Jewish history, in the long history of Judaism, there were a couple of, in, a couple of occasions which are monumental, right? Monumentally important to know about Judaism and about our world today, how Jews are in the world today, why they change, why they do the things they do. And, you know, uh, and these would be things like as big as, say, in Christianity, say you picked uh, the birth of Jesus, right, and the crucifixion. I mean, those are pretty big, dear Christian, right? Or the establishment when Peter says, I have the keys, or Jesus says, I'm making you the rock upon which my church will be founded. You know, there's equally big incidents in the life of Judaism uh, that most people don't even know. And they're meant to be you know, talking to you all about Jews and everything. It's like, do you know anything? And, and one of the things that matters is that Judaism had an esoteric core, right? There were esoteric traditions that sneakily Jews would have to do it sort of in private because their families and their culture were just frown on this, right? And one of them was the Kabbalistic tradition at the top. You know, the top rabbis could go to the sort of fifth level and study Kabbalah. Yeah, but that's not the only tradition. They had a Gnostic tradition. Uh, and so that would have then come into Christianity as a sort of Judaic element. And this is where you get then groups like the Essenes, right? And not just them, the Mandeans and the Ebionites, right? Uh, and the Galilean tradition, right? All of these traditions, there was many of them, right? Um, the Therapeutae is another group, right? Some would be more hermetic than others, and others are very, very Gnostic, right? Um, and then just at the time that the Nag Hammadi library, these texts that were dug out of the Syrian desert or whatever, was discovered uh, just about the same year or the year before the Dead Sea Scrolls was discovered, right? So then there's another, there's like suddenly you get these texts and they're not completely the same, right? The Essenes were not necessarily Gnostics. Some people call them proto-Gnostics. The great John Allegro thought of them as proto-Gnostics. But other people say, no, no, they're just mess messianic Jews who lived outside Jerusalem. It's a political statement bit of religion, the normal Judaism in there, but hardcore Judaism, nothing Gnostic about it. It's hardcore Judaism, you know, fuck the Sanhedrin, fuck Jerusalem temple. We're going to live out here, you know, butt naked and, and live in a little community, you know, because we're going back to the underlying tenets of Judaism. So that's not to be mistaken as Gnosticism. But because the Dead Sea, because the Nag Hammadi library of Gnostic gospels was discovered so close, you know, chronologically, a lot of people mistake the two. The Nag Hammadi Library, as it's called, and even that's somewhat inadequate, that's just describing the location from which these most of these texts were discovered. And people said, hey, what's this thing called Gnosticism, right? And then they found that word Gnosticos, you know, whatever, in the only, it was Bishop Irenaeus. God, no, I don't even remember when he was from, you have to look it up, you know, 12th century or something like that, you know, was the first guy to use this term and allude to Gnostics, but nobody had ever found a Gnostic. So until the Nag Hammadi Library was discovered in 1940s, that was just an entry in Bishop Irenaeus's books, and he was a naysayer of the Gnostics. And people went, I wonder who they were, right? And then they thought, oh, maybe this Cathars in France, maybe the Bogomils. Nobody could really nail it down. As a matter of fact, they still really haven't, because as I just said, many people think the Essenes were Gnostics, and that's completely false, right? Proto is, I think the Mandeans were. You know, so so remember, the Essenes connection is important in my work because the Essenes are very akin akin to the Knights Templar. So you get books written about the Knights Templar being Gnostics, because so, so because the connection to the Essenes has been made. But when you don't know that the, the Essenes were not particularly Gnostic, then you can easily see a later group as being Gnostic, and so now you're off on that tangent, and that's not particularly correct. No, 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 they were members of the fourth sect of which the Essenes were obviously a member of the, the, the Nazarene sect. It's called the Nazarenes, the fourth sect. And the Mandeans and the Essenes were part of that sect. Maybe others as the Ebionites, hardcore Jewish, hardcore, you know, into 
into uh, various Jewish uh, traditions. Uh, certainly you could say, oh, Kabbalism is part of that tradition, but not Gnosticism. You see, so there's lots of dead ends you can get into. The Knights Templar, you know, if you start thinking of them as Gnostic, you know, I don't know if that really works, you know, just to, just to bring that point up. But uh, now you've got neo-Gnostics, all these Gnostic societies opening up everywhere. And I, th I we've done presentations showing that even it's live and well, and that even what we would normally call the New Age movement is Gnostic. And this whole Eckhart Tolle and Oprah Winfrey number, a lot of that, why it's bent towards Eastern mysticism, don't be fooled, it's not. It's not, it looks like Eastern mysticism on the surface, but it's really a kind of a neo-Gnosticism that's extremely dangerous for our times, based in a very ancient cult. Because the thing that now needs to be mentioned is that these Gnostics didn't go away. Uh, descendants, either ideological or biological, of the original Gnostics, and some of them are very, very dark ideas, you know, that brings about that cyberpunk power one. Look at that, and I know who who invented that, or at least who's infected by the ideas of that. And they're not the only ones. It's all through the media, advertising. It's a lot to do with the modern uh, denominations of well-known religions. It's infused with all this Gnostic nonsense. The New Age movement is infused with it. A lot of the law of attraction cult, you know, seeds of truth inside it, right? But it's been contaminated. So we've done innumerable, you know, uh, comments on that and the whole podcast on it as well. I bring that up in the Women in the Unconscious series, at least five of those programs. There's a program called, uh, well, we did one called Gnosticism, a podcast. There's another one called The Law of Attraction Refuted or whatever. That's probably the best one on Gnosticism, and there's still more to come. So the Gnostics are still alive. And the trouble is that just in the same way that modern evangelist preachers or modern Mormons or modern Jehovah's Witnesses are filthy rich. We know this. The weird thing is that Gnosticism, both when it was Jewish Gnosticism and even when it was, you know, Christian Gnosticism, which really means Alexandrian, did attract some of the wealthiest people of those communities. So now there is this weird social, you know, and these would be rich socialists. They weren't, it's not right to use the word capitalist even in those days. These are extremely wealthy concerns who became Gnostic because in having everything, you know, maybe more than three garages full of stuff, real billionaires. In fact, the head of KLM, the uh, Dutch uh, uh, airline, is a Gnostic. So this is just one example. Billionaires. My guess is even people like George Soros, right, and Bill Gates. If you look, they may pretend to be Buddhist on the surface. Or There's a lot of ways they cover. You know, their their interest in Gnosticism. So these Eckhart Tolle's, they're all part of a cult. Now they, they refract and they make it look like they're interested in Buddhism or veganism or whatever, right? New Ageism, but actually they're Gnostics. Yeah, yeah. And this even goes for people like Anthony Robbins and lots of lots of people you wouldn't first think of. But anyway, the billionaire level is where it gets really dirty and ugly because Gnosticism appears on the surface to be denial of the world and denial of the body. That's categorical, right? But there's a wrinkle, there's a twist. And that's where my work comes in to try and show you this twist that maybe somebody like an, uh, uh, an Alvin Boyd Kuhn kind of missed. He's, he's one of the greatest geniuses, you know, exposing the falsity. Uh, Sri R. Aurobindo, uh, the Indian mystic, would have been another. And, and Gerald Massey, their great mentor behind them, he would have done so. But there's a few little errors that they missed. And one is this, that at some point, I don't know when, it could have been in ancient times or it could be more a modern thought, when the big Gnostics sat down, uh, they said to themselves that, look, our mandate, our calling card, our main PR is about that the world is a cage of the soul, the body is a cage of the spirit. It has to be vacated. There's a higher light than the light, you know, of the Demerg. All these traditional points. A new Gnostic, I really don't know where they got this. So I'm still looking into it, but, you know, Somebody with the brains came up and said, look, let's use aversion therapy. Glut yourselves with the stuff of the world. And since we believe it's corrupt, you know, as aversion theory would be like you can't quit smoking. So they have you smoke, you know, 200 cigarettes, you know, of a day, one after the other, you know, and then you can't stand the smell or eat chocolate till you're blue in the face and you never want to see another piece. So like these people who work in chocolate factories and they can't, they can't eat chocolate because they smell it all day long, you know, or a biscuit factory. And that smell is so repulsive to them that it becomes aversive. Well, think of the earth as that biscuit factory. So they just say, keep on eating and smelling the butter and the, you know, the biscuit and 
you know, as people, these people who work in these factories say, I can't stand the, I never eat the, I never eat my own company's biscuits because I'm saturated in it, right? You know what I mean? With the chocolate that we make over there, Bourneville or Cadbury's or whatever. And this is a weird aversion therapy, right? So the Gnostics took this and said, we're not getting a lot of success in life by keep on telling people to hate the world because they're sensual. They love sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But I'll tell you what, if we saturate the world with sex, drugs, and rock and roll, let's see what happens. And through, so through the Esalen Institute, and you know, it just goes on and on and on, and basically through the media. You know, I, I did these debunking things on, you know, your two, two on the new age fraud, and I was hovering around this, you know, your Debbie Ford's Deepak Chopra cult. Uh, I went at that, and this was on the back of my mind, and hopefully I thought of enslaved survives, you know, and it has, thanks to members, I would get to then opening this up more and exploring it more. And the basic fact is, in short, the Gnostic, it's still Gnostic to say, gorge yourselves to death. Because then gorged, like Mr. Creosote in the Monty Python story, in the film Meaning of Life, you will come crawling to us, puking up your guts of all the worldly stuff and go, save me! What was that stuff about your God again? So there's a weird twist that nobody else addresses in Gnosticism. They stopped at some point. Uh, maybe it was the decadent West. Maybe it was the decadence that they saw that they actually despise. Obviously, they are ascetics, right? There's a word. They believe in self-mortification. They're, 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 there's St. Simon of the Stylites. There's all sorts of Christian groups, you know, and other groups that they've spawned. But they suddenly pull back from this technique, just as a matter of technique, and realize it's not really working. And then the billionaire set bought into this. So the most extraordinary thing is, and I was amongst these people, so I have firsthand knowledge of them all, right? That the billionaire who becomes a Gnostic is the most extraordinary creature. They've got houses in Hawaii, they've got houses in LA, they own ranches, they own yachts, super yachts, a fleet of cars, but they're Gnostics. So I stood in their driveways and watched all this, somewhat, you know, illiterately, uh, soaking it up more through observation, just raw observation, just phenomenology, just using what's obviously there. And later on in my life, starting to contemplate it more and, and savor it more and think about it more deeply. But first it was just like raw experience. What's all this in, mate? You know, you're coming from the streets of Belfast or whatever, right? You're like, What's all this? You know, billions. And then it takes time to put it all together. What, they're Gnostics? Yes, they're Gnostics. And they're the ones that are glutted with the stuff of the world. Then they send out your Anthony Robbins types, not him specifically, but that type. And the Oprah Winfrey's and Eckhart Tolle's and say, Eat and be merry. Experience the world, right? Uh, uh, to discover how fatuous and empty it is. This is a lot of currency. It actually it has actually stabilized the New Age movement. So billionaires like people like this Oprah and others, that's exactly what they're doing in their private life, and that's what they're advocating basically to the very affluent you know groups that uh, sit there. And, and it's not difficult for a Russell Brand to start iterating the same thing, you know, say, oh, that's really interesting. Or another joker, you know, in this movement, you know, can easily fall for it. Like you said, you're seeing it everywhere. I'm seeing it everywhere as well. Alex has Jones has currency. Prison Planet TV or used to. I don't follow him really, but uh, I know that that was one of his programs, Prison Planet. I mean, there's yeah. nothing more Gnostic than that title. That's correct. That's exactly correct. Uh, of course, it has a other meanings that one can identify with, but yeah, absolutely. In the in the total consensus, in the total view, that's a Gnostic principle, and it, it doesn't smell right. It would make you worry. Or it makes me worry, right? And then when you see this extraordinary stuff, uh, so this might be a twist for people listening to this who studied Gnosticism, like you know the person I mentioned earlier who've been reading all the books on it, and they haven't come across this. And then your journey will be impaired. You need this extra light. You know, you need this extra sort of uh, switch on the light to really shine up their ideology they have planned this out to say that there's another way to get them coming back to our supreme spirit or god or whatever you know uh, and that is to gorge on the world gorge on the world and so and then to do that they're billionaires because this would be just you can come up with any theory on the boardroom who's going to fund it the billionaires that i'm talking about were able to change the media change own the magazines own the media to saturate your ass with all of that stuff they're the ones doing it. So it makes me believe that a, a very great quotient behind, you know, a demographic behind the actual media are Gnostics or others who have, you know, their lieutenants who are just doing it, making it, creating it, but they don't really know. And this goes for video games, like the cyberpunk thing and many other things. And there's this off world. It's not even just off world. It's supernatural, which is, a, which is totally a lunatic mysteria. How can anything be outside the natural world? 
uh, Walter Russell would kill himself laughing at that, Nikola Tesla, any of the people who are the great brains of our world. In fact, you see, even the Gnostic principles are actually quite irrational, it would be even almost too soft a word. They talk about the higher light, right? I mean, their God is the supreme light, and then we're down here. But then I'd say, but we have light here. We have solar light. I can see light right now. We have all sorts of light here. Are you telling me that's evil and demonic? Well, yeah, it's of a lower fallen light created by their archon, their demiurge. Or, you know, uh, but I go, how, how can you know that? To know that, you would have had to experience the higher light to compare the two. Have you done that? They go, no, 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 uh, we haven't. But we know that there's a higher light. You go, yeah, okay, so, right, uh, something you haven't seen yourself to compare with the light we've got here makes you demonize the light you've got here? But you can't compare the one to the other. You've not done actual an actual experiment to tell yourself whether the truth, you just accept it on faith somewhere. The light I see right here looks pretty holy to me, the solar light, right? And the light that we know exists uh, all around us ambiently and, and the light of the mind. And you're coming along and you're trying to tell me that there's something wrong with that light, right? That that, that, that light is in some way of a lower order. I don't understand you, or I, think, or I do understand you, but it doesn't make sense to me, right? You know. Let me let me jump in here because this is where simulation theory comes in. And I think that's actually one of the crucial key factors in why there's the resurgence of Gnosticism. Because first people were probably warmed up to the idea by hearing about simulation theory. So if it was even possible that you could enter into a computer simulation like the Matrix movie and have no idea you're in it. I guess in that instance, then all the light you see would be artificial or a false light, the way that they say that the light of this world is. And, you know, maybe someone's had a transcendent, quote unquote, experience themselves where they perhaps, I mean, perhaps entered into a state of pleuromic oneness, a pure white light, kind of like that Buddhist uh, idea of the pure white light of mind. Another ideology, by the way, which is rooted in this same concept with the uh, samsara and reality as illusion thing. And that's why it makes a, a good cover for some of these types that you're describing. Buddhism's a good cover for that, even Hinduism to that degree. But <clears throat> with the uh, simulation theory being entered here into the, the narrative here, now you have a scientific materialist way to conceptualize the very same prison planet the demiurge is in the archons are now the computer programmers. And so to get into this cyberpunk game, one of the things that is really relevant to uh, the plot is that the player has the option to basically enter, transfer their consciousness into cyberspace and to exist there as a potential outcome for the story. And this is the wet dream of the Elon Musks and all these uh, weird Ray Kurzweil types that have the, I guess, plan that we're going to save ourselves from the destruction of our own ecosystem by entering into an artificial ecosystem digitally. But that is, to me, the perfect example of, of the Gnostic ascension, because if you enter a simulation where you're in charge of it, it how is that different conceptually than transcending to the, the true God? the true light above the artificial world where you're reunited with the true creator and I guess become it. And then you have your own world that you can create from there or, or whatever they imagine happens in this supernatural fantasy. So truly with the things being bandied about by these transhumanists and these simulation theory proponents, we've got a very similar thing here that now, yeah, it's warming people up to, to this idea. And I think also we, with the rich individuals, the billionaires, they've also got a different tactic besides just the saturation of media with the corrupt things of the world, uh, which is to try and jailbreak the reality, to try to do something that would somehow break the system or break the rules. Maybe that's what the whole large Hadron Collider is an attempt to do. I mean, there sure is a lot of ritual and pomp and circumstance around that with the big Shiva statue outside of the building and the strange ceremonies that they hold uh, sometimes with very pagan and druidic symbolism, weird stuff. But uh, I want to, to get in to point out like a very specific point about these physicists that are trying to propose simulation theory. I snagged an article titled physicist creates AI algorithm that may prove reality is a simulation. 
And he claims that this, that this guy is a Princeton physicist named Hong Quinn or uh, Q-I-N. I'm not sure how you'd pronounce that in a Chinese dialect, but he claims that his AI algorithm can predict planetary orbits. And because it can do that, that must mean it's correct about everything else it predicts. I don't know. But to quote the uh, unusual approach taken by his work, he directly says, usually in physics, you make observations, create a theory based on those observations, and then use that theory to predict new observations. What I'm doing is replacing this process with a type of black box that can produce accurate predictions without using a traditional theory or law. Essentially, I bypassed all the fundamental ingredients of physics. I go directly from data to data. There is no law of physics in the middle. And there's that black box again. What do you think of this? Yeah, that's odd. Uh, remember this, uh, the billionaire set that's really the powerful Gnostic cult are always looking for back crazy idiots like him to fund. Remember I said that their ultimate Gnostic core is so bankrupt? They're finding that out now. They're finding out that the simulation that they all backed through MIT or whoever, the, you know, the Ray Kurzweil types, as you say, that has backfired completely. First of all, I could have told them from the start that creating a lower order that's created by a physical man this, to, to prove a higher order doesn't work in the first place, because no matter what your simulation is, it's created by human thought. You're programming the computer. That's already a fallacy. The universe is not a computer programmed by anyone. And you can't create a lower order structure or system to prove the higher one, right? That's not the way Gnosticism works. But being, but, but being desperate to try and find proofs, they've entered into the back door into science, hoping that some of the discoveries which look, look attractive to them will, will be this way. It's not going to work because, uh, first of all, they're using a kind of science that's already bankrupt. You know, and if you read the Ken Wilbers, and you read the Arthur Kostler's, you'll know that, right? It's based on Holonic, right? We still have to get there yet. So even the simulations and all the kind of uh, in vogue science that we've got is really a very lower form of science. So the Gnostic has made a big mistake by trying to go to lower order science, you know, like computer simulations, because people like Hubert Dreyfus and others from the Heideggerian school have absolutely confirmed that a computer will never do even the most remote things that a human brain can do. So the whole, the whole tactic, so the tactic is now PR, and the tactic is now smokescreen and just using the words like simulation. It's just down to the words. And when you live in the words like that, then you can turn, you know, like what he's saying. It's not just living in the words about you've actually sort of gone out of dimensions altogether. You're not even really talking about the universe as the universe really is. It's mysteria. You're talking about the idea that you have, and it's a Gnostic idea. That idea doesn't have any substantiality at all. So. There's a triple, you know, like we said, those, you know, the, the mysteria just keeps generating itself and they, they can't find their way back. It's what's happened in quantum science. Quantum science originally taught them something really great, which is that there is rational limits to the universe and that the more and more you try to observe the, you know, the fundamental building blocks of, of the reality, the less you can see them because there's something in built into our mind's observation, right? And that's a very interesting theory and can be talked about for hours, and there's lots of you know, interesting ramifications of that. But basically, uh, it, it, they didn't draw from that the spiritual, uh, or some did, but uh, you know, most of them did not. They were very troubled by that, because it's really different kinds of consciousness than we have. It's the, it's the right brain consciousness. You know, again, that's still words, still terms, but I think it works. That's the right brain reality of the creator that brought everything into being. We can't read that because we're so literally at the bottom of the ladder. But the Gnostic is pretty much the same, right? He has realized that there's a, you know, see, because we've moved on in history. Right now, they have the sophisticated tools and they have the sophisticated minds to realize they've, that their theory is bankrupt. So I think Gnosticism has changed within itself. It's still going on. It's still being wheeled out. But it's almost like, you know, the guy at the penthouse is, is dead at his desk. And there's a revolver on the table. Right. But the things, the, the mechanism below still, you know, clunks away. But the brain at the top is gone. That's what I feel. And that's and the why second in command tries to act like he's still getting orders from the big cheese. That's it. That's exactly what's happening. And, I, and I've always sensed this through the 90s and into now. So my work on Gnosticism, because I got a lot of better things to do, but I continue doing that because I believe that that is the case. And then hermetic elements. So Disciples of Mysterium, the Schelling book, you know, going back to German mysticism. 
in some way, you know, driven by something I don't know, but I've, I've produced those to try and then say, okay, let's restore. If this thing is really ready to crumble and fall, I, I don't think people will do well with an abyss. It'll be too much like a freezing void. So let's let's uh, nourish it. You know, let's bring back something green. You know, Alfred North Whitehead, the shelling. There's a lot of areas to go to bring back. So in my own humble way, you know, we'll see what happens tomorrow with maybe more work on that subject. But uh, my, in my own way, that's that's what's needed. And since I've studied this stuff, what's it going to be in my head or on my personal shelf? You know, through these platforms, we can bring a little bit out to see if it intrigues people and they can sort of wean themselves away from this Gnosticism. But when you look at Elon Musk, and I'm glad you brought him up, there's a very interesting aspect to this. It might answer the whole of reason why Gnosticism even began, even back in you know Alexandria or wherever. And that is, if you look at these kinds of people, they're armored. Right? They have emotional plague, most of these guys. When you want to get away from your body because you don't like to be in it, you're a Gnostic. So the roots of Gnosticism are to be found in Wilhelm Reich. Right? You're not trying to get away from the planet. You're not trying to get away from reality. You're trying to get away from yourself. Now, we wouldn't have known this until the 1930s, you know, when you had Freud and the whole psychoanalysis began. So my conversations with this person in 90 uh, helped her a lot, you know, to, to sort of uh, get stable, not, not fly around the room and, and, and lose, 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 lose herself, right? So there was this, uh, which was a danger, because this Gnostic stuff can be very, very dangerous, actually. So the grounding of it was, that uh, to realize that it's all based in psychosoma, it's psychosomatic, right? And you couldn't know that about Gnosticism until quite late in the, you know, in time, like the 20th century. And then even then you needed your auto ranks and the Wilhelm Reiches, you know. So by 1940, and it's interesting, it's in 1940 that the Gnostic Gospels was discovered. It's just there is another force working in life, believe you me, right, on that deeper archetypal level. Kind of like because the way that Pluto was discovered about the same time as theories the of the unconscious came out, and Pluto symbolizes that. That's exactly the way I've always looked at it. And so this is then, you know, what happened to this friend of mine, you can say, is now, you know, the whole world might be going through it. And that is that once you discover that it's all based in your own unpleasure, in the Reikian sense, that your body and your erogenous zones, your skin, everything, has not been made a source of pleasure to you. Now, again, we're talking about degrees. This is not by any means a didactic statement. But in general, the Western world is armored, helped by false teaching, false parenting, religion, all, there's so many things, so many ways that this comes to be. We can't explore it all here. Um, and then a lot of, let's take women, for instance, right? A lot of other satellite, you know, illnesses and conditions like bulimia, anorexia, breakouts, even in all of us, right, comes all of these secondary manifestations of this condition, this emotional plague. But one of the conditions, just in the same way that you can have physical ailments arise from it, not to mention just general stiffness, you know, and, and pain in the muscles and oh, every disease you can think of actually comes from this. So one has to understand that, but also, uh, uh, you know, also pathology, right? Pathocratic, this creates a whole uh, psychopathology as well, which you, because you, you, you mentioned earlier about the more deaths, the more suicides, right? All of that you're talking about comes back to this emotional plague. But Gnosticism is rooted in the same thing. That's what my studies have, you know, continued to prove. I think Alvin Boyd Kuhn talks about this. He's definitely the, the person for that, you know, because he definitely talks about a cult of mortification. That's his own word. It's a fascinating term, cult of mortification. And even though it's glossed over with a lot of expensive, you know, pullovers and sets and, you know, like I said, the millionaire set doing its thing, although all of that wealth, the California, you know, imagery is in front of it, doesn't change this essential fact. In their thinking, in their minds, and in their psychosoma, in the Reichian way, they're armored. Now, Elon Musk's face, oh, we don't want to get into the whole thing, but if you just, if you know body language and you know how to read these people, it's there, right? And so that he looks like he's me, in pain constantly, just that's existing. Right. Yeah. Yes. Reich talks very much about ocular armoring. And one of Reich's and Alexander Lohan is to look in the eyes and see the deadness. You know, if you live in Palo Alto, you, you'll have a crash course in that. But the thing is that that's, that's definitely what you're dealing with, right? It's the deadness that shows in the eyes and, and is also manifest in the rest of the body. Now, that, the consequence of that is you, you disown your body psychically. 
and you get into virtual realities, you get into simulation theory, and you get into Gnosticism. You actually get into religion, but as you perfect, and if you're a higher brow, usually low brow people don't get into Gnosticism. They stick with evangelism, Jehovah's Witness knock on your door, you know, like cardboard wooden people with wooden theories. But remember, there's a lot of highbrow people. You do have your Kurt Wilds. You do have your Elon Musk. These are the ones that really worry me. You have your, you know, Nicholas Rorish in the past and lots of people who get converted to Gnosticism. They're the, the dangerous ones because they get the money to build churches, to purvey and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, and uh, proselytize all of this jive, you know, uh, like the cyberpunk tarot. And they, they're heavily involved in virtual gaming and all of this kind of thing, they're seducing the young away from the reality that's in front of them. So it's not that there's a higher reality, there is an idea of it in their mind, that makes it mysterious. The higher realm above the realm of the, Demi well, even the Demiurg, right, and the Archon, all of that is ideas that they have generated from their own warped mind. There's no Archon, there's just your brain wanting to dissociate itself, you know, from the body, that's the Archon. So you are the Archon. Now, beautifully, this has been pointed out in the highest forms of science fiction. Blake Seven, The Prisoner, Right, uh, Doctor Who, over and over again, but nobody got it. The uh, archons are like advocate. the archetypes that you've, uh, you know, shoved off to the side that are coming back to bring you to the imperial self by knocking you across the head. They're not yeah. your masters. Oh no, no. That, 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 see, Gnostic elements entered into Jung. He, he discarded them as well. But Stefan Haller and the Gnostic movement jumped. Remember, I told you they're rich enough and powerful enough to watch and scan the world for anybody's work. And then they jump into what is basically a hermetic work, even in Jung, it was hermetic. He toyed with the thing, but they published that book, right? The Gnostic movement tried to co-opt him, just like they've tried to co-opt Kostler or Wilbur or anybody, it doesn't really work, right? And, but you have to be so cautious, this is the conversations I had with this person before, it was mostly counseling, coaching, warning, right down to look, looking at individual lines. We spent many hours, you know, just, taking out the Gnostic Gospels and, and analyzing it and all of this, because what happens is the converted person who really believes this, who thinks they're living in a, a cage of the world, they can still be supreme artists, supreme digital uh, you know, graphic people. Uh, and I think they're top heavy, I really do. I think that's why the trend of California did turn new age. I, I think it's Gnostic underpinnings. And it, it's worrisome, I've, I lived there for years before I moved to Seattle, right? And it's no different in Seattle, isn't that one, one of the places that the big tech came from? So then I discovered this is wall to wall. What are you going to do about it? And, so, and the champions are very, very seductive people. Like these Eckhart Tolle's, they're not stupid who they pick. You're up against all of this. What a few articles from somebody like myself is going to change anything? No way, right? So, but that doesn't stop you trying. You I know, know people in, in the truth movement, so, so called, that will tell people that Young is responsible for the Tavistock takeover of media and the right. mind control manipulation. I'm like, just because oh someone's God. work was used and corrupted and most people's idea of someone's work is based on other people's ideas of their work, right. not because they read it themselves, doesn't right. mean that that individual is to blame. I want to shift to return to selfhood as a concept, selfhood versus simulation. I want to demonstrate how simulation is collectivism, actually. If we, I, this is something I'm a big fan of doing, but I like to go back to the Webster's 1828 dictionary or things of around that time to see what words meant before they were perverted. Yeah. You know, I mean, a good example was last week, uh, our guest told, told us that the word race meant family originally before it was turned into racism, which is all mm -hmm. being anti-racist is anti-family. And if you investigate these groups, you'll see exactly what that is. The BLMs in there the communist manifesto that they've put out. So simulation in this older definition is the act of feigning to be that which is not, the assumption of a deceitful appearance or character. So basically a false character. It both are comprehended in the word hypocrisy. So hypocrisy, what does that mean? It means not being yourself, essentially. And why would you simulate an alternate self? It would be for the approval of the collective. It's the public persona. It's the straw man self. The, the hypocrisy is psychic self-murder. And I think that's uh, why simulation theory is attractive is because people are not realizing that it's their own sort of uh, unconscious trying to reflect back to them in the world that simulation is what you, you live in. You live as a simulator. You live as hypocrisy. 
and therefore simulation theory makes sense. Yeah, and if you look up the word, the meaning of the real word utopia, you know, which is the thing about all these scientism and science wants it, it means no place. So right within their own doctrine is the is their own strangely it's strangely from a left-handed point of view, all you need to know is contained within. That's why in the Gnostic Gospels themselves, you can see how psychotic it is when you read them without this religious trapping. And then you realize that Judaism is born out of the same hatred of the body. And that Christianity is right. So when they when these Christians get up in your face, go, we are not Gnostic. Let me show you the reams of proof of this. It doesn't matter what they show you. You are already an armored person. You're already an emotional plague. So why would I want to listen to your psychotic creations? I know that you've built them up in the rubber room from the bottom to the top. Yeah, but that's why you're still in the rubber room. I don't want to read all your psychotic ramblings as you think out what we're talking about. You're not part of the debate. You're the fucking victim. You are the, the one who's riddled with emotional plague. But they don't see that, you see. So there's no way of, we're getting to this point of critical mass where the ignorance factor has moved to various other levels in which it's they're impervious to seeing the other side of, you know, and that's the gradual type of education we've been having, I'm saying. But it's also exacerbated by bad parenting and just the lack of self-reflexiveness. So a hermetic person is not going to be able to even turn to their own documents with them and say, this is hermetic, this is Gnostic, this is Gnostic, this is hermetic. Do you get it? They go, no, right? They're not going to. They're not going to understand the definitions. So even if you did, which you, this is brilliant, what you discovered there, right? And you go into the etymology and you show them, or you bring up the argument that, look, no lower simulation created by a human mind can in any way give you real insight into something that is beyond, meant to be, by definition, beyond the human mind. They, they wouldn't get that, you see? They'll just say, no, I'm going to take this. I need proof. And this is we're offering this up as proof. And they're hoping that most of the world will not be as intelligent as we are to work it out and double think it. They think that everybody will just accept it. And unfortunately, they do because they own the media. You got crisis actors. Yeah, guess what? They can, there's crisis actors on all sorts of levels. They can have people believe a thing just by repetition. Just Michael, because on the crisis actor thing, in one of the recent events that happened during this year's season of sacrifice, I kid you not, I saw body bags stacked up and zoomed in on a hand reaching up from inside of one of the body bags with mm. a lit cigarette and you could just see the cigarette you gotta be kidding me you saw that him taking a drag but you couldn't see the face that was taking the drag and then the hand goes back down right yeah. there in front of people's eyes on live television yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's how far into simulation people are that they can't even see the reality in front of them that there's a living body in a body bag smoking a cigarette relax yeah. knowing that it won't yeah. even matter yeah, like Marshall McLuhan, you know, said, the medium becomes the message. The fact that it's on TV, and TV is a giant to you now. See, the giant, the thing in the, the hypnotist in the corner of the room is really of epic proportions because it's on TV, even though it's actually physically shrunk, all the images on it. But in your mind, as a simulation, it's huge. Anything that appears on there is, you know, an authority figure bar none. And so a little wormy person like Eckhart Tolle or Oprah Winfrey become, become iconic. This is how it's done. So it's false iconography. It's false masculinity because you're thinking it's a hero, an icon, which is a thing that the mind accepts as bigger than yourself so that you can live up to it and grow into it. The media has furnished us with these Gnostic versions, Gnosticism, and a lot of different things that appears in many different ways you wouldn't first think of. right? And one of them is this blasting up, this inflation of these liars and cheats. And there's, what, what message are they selling you? They've used idioms from other places, I grant you that. But what is, what is their real message, right? And then when you go into it, and hopefully you can bring to bear you know, the Arthur Koestlers, the Alvin Void Coons, the Ken Wilbers, to have the alternative theory. See, me, I've learned through my years of studying this that when you want to countermand it, you have to have its diametric opposite, you know, known, uh, the Hubert Dreyfuses and all, because they're quite, they're quite eloquent. And these are fervent people. They're just like your absolute, you know, Bible bashing, Bible belt person. They know their stuff. So in order to counter it, you kind of have to know your stuff. And that, that sends you into a lot of areas you may not normally want to go, you know, or you may not have time for it. But you have to because otherwise they'll win the day. And I'm not a person who is willing, willing to let that happen. You know, you talked about the, the disclosure of, uh, you know, the underground of Irish politics. Even though I knew when to keep quiet, I wasn't going to give up, you know, bringing that, that knowledge to them. Now, in a movie like Zardoz, you see, they're, they're thrashing this all out about the difference between uh, the Gnostic idea that this, you know, the community there, the vortex, 
is created by it's all simulation right it's an attempt to simulate only this time it's the in that show it was the attempt to make the human robotic right not have a robot that can do which is one of the lies that they've used all through these years that we'll have robots and cyborgs and uh, androids you know to do the human work this labor save that old one yeah and for your own protection no in zardos they're already taking it as a, as a fact that the immortality that the, the beings in the vortex have the humans so to speak is that they've become mechanistic and robotic because it, it it's so mechanistic that it didn't work on some of them remember they have the apathetics there so the fallout people were well that's the program they say in the tinkering that we did to the human brain by putting that crystal in their forehead yeah it didn't kind of work and then so we have these apathetics they're kind of eternal beings but they're slowly corroding or dying and they have a whole part of the village remember that these guys live in right well that proves us mechanistic and unnatural because these were the fallouts from the experiment like the, you know the rabbits that didn't the rats that didn't sort of do what you wanted as you're you know poking them and, and prodding them so it's all artificial but then they show that in the end of the day the beautiful statement that burman is saying is it will corrode right the vortex is unsustainable the tabernacle is unsustainable but when you had mentioned earlier that it is a collective thing look what that how emphasized that is where even in the end when one speaks in, in zardos you hear the chiming in of the all we are the tabernacle the tabernacle is us there is no we right and it's the same with this technology it's the same with the scientism which has been now been plugged gnosticism and scientism have basically become one and so it is like we are everything we are the all there is nothing but us. There's no individual voice, even though there's a parody of an individual voice, but you hear it beautifully, you know, it's echoing the whole collective. So the planet is being turned into this sort of technocracy in which everyone is sacrificing self to the, to the tabernacle. But the beauty is that in that film, they show that it's unsustainable and it basically starts to crack at the seams and fall away, you know? And so just as, just as in the political world, as I've maintained from the start, well, they also well, become is, degenerate, Michael. That's the other thing yeah. is because they're so roboticized and everything's so sterilized that the only feeling that they can get is through sort of like degenerate, witnessing degenerate behavior. And where are we at now? Yeah, yeah. There's an orgiastic aspect to this, absolutely. There's also the last hurrah, as is the only term I can think of. It's the same you're having in socialism. Everything that you've seen in 2020 is a last hurrah of socialism. It's the orgiastic acceptance, we're done. And just at the end of the party, see at the end when you've exhausted yourself, you go out with an explosion. So as mad as things looked in 2020, read from a psychosocial point of view, it's actually a really positive thing. These guys couldn't keep in their toxic plague anymore. So bad as it was to experience it, you know, being uh, exercised outside. Ah, but a, a person who's into holistic health goes, no, 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 it's, it's maybe all right. Because this explosion is sort of the last gasp of something that should have died long ago and has maintained and maintained and built up and built up all the resentment, all the pus, and somehow it has to all come out. Damage has been done, but we can repair that. The manly way, the, the masculine heroic way, I say, oh, well, fucking, we'll put the statues back up, you know, we can make them again. That's why I'm never a pessimist about what happens, you see, even as what we've seen is so bad. But the thing is that I'm also hoping that this big, you know, grunt or whatever is the last death spasm of socialism well it's the same in gnosticism the same metaphor applies to gnosticism if gnosticism is on its way out because all of this technology didn't help them right the simulations that they were interested in since the 60s and before it it didn't work for them right it just simply didn't work it's not a proper metaphor it didn't substantiate their core belief because the core belief is psychotic and even the technology didn't really you know help them there right they were hoping to prove their theory that this world is a simulation well it's not and, and their th theory is stupid because they were said about the light. How could they know that the light they see here is inferior to the light that's up there if you've never seen it? At least if you could prove it to me, I might believe you. But since you can't, and the whole thing is ridiculous, then um, it falls away. You can't tell me. about. If you tell me that it's a theory, will you tell me anything? Right? You can tell me the moon is made of cheese. Uh, I, don't, I don't let my mind be so guided that way. I want rational proofs. And Gnosticism doesn't have them. It's all mysteria generated. And when you see somebody like, you know, my friend who's sort of, you know, getting a little bit possessed by it, made, there was a Gnostic center not far away. Within five miles of where this all happened, there was a prominent Gnostic center on, uh, uh, on, on Alma Avenue or what the hell, Middlefield Road or whatever the hell in Palo Alto. I actually went there myself. 
you know, I, you know, I was studying all these different paths. I was a member of Sufism and all of this. And uh, something in the end, I don't know what it was, stopped me going. But I was right there at the door. I actually went up there. I took the number down, you know, and they had the symbol on the thing. I was thinking, you go to the little church. But something, you know, by that time, it was starting to, uh, unf it was starting to melt. You know, something just in my own studies, I came across Gerald Massey, you know, and, all this, and it, it started to weaken. But when you don't have those alternative sources, this can be very, very attractive, yes, as pathological as it is. But then going back to the core equation, I'm not, I didn't have a bad relationship with my own body. So something inside of me was not going to go for Gnosticism. Uh, you know, you could experiment, you could go see what they're like, you know, uh, have some tea and biscuits with them and all and find out what they believe. But the, I was never going to become one because I really do believe that you have to be a frigid type. You have to be a, uh, uh, an armored type is the only word right now I can think of, right? In the Reishian sense. And you want to get out of reality. But your core reality is your own body. That is reality. You experience the other reality actually secondarily, right? Your reality is the right brain, but the left brain has come on, you know, as a simulation. We've already we're already dealing with simulation in the left brain, uh, and, and also in a uh, aberrant, malignant relationship with the body, and that really put me off Gnosticism. I start to see that the coloring, the, some of the sophistry, some of the, even the beauty that Gnosticism has in some of its iterations, you know, uh, was was, and, and then the, this whole thing about hierarchies and all. It, it didn't work. So by, I'd say by the latest 92, maybe a bit after that 93, I was done with it. And then I, I got involved in other things, you know, uh, that, that, that then continued to confirm that original doubt. Right? You had this figured out before I was even five years old. <laughs> what I think is important, uh -huh. I know some, you know, 2020 saw a lot of suicides and uh, really, I think these ideas are at the root of the belief that suicide could even be a solution, honestly, That's right. because point. when people do commit suicide, isn't it with the belief that they're going to have some relief from reality, yeah. but That's there's right. no reality other than self. That is the only reality that you could ever experience. And the same goes for God to quote your book. The only experience capable of proving that God exists is a man's own experience. An intelligent God would not be ignorant of the fact that no individual is capable of convincing others of his existence. Right. So with those two statements, the entire enterprise of explaining a higher reality beyond this one and how you even know about it to begin with is uh, so dubious, then that it all falls apart right there with those two statements that you cannot do that. And what are you escaping by committing suicide? Uh, are you not going to just enter into a different type of body, a different type of reality or experience? If existence is the only thing that exists, there could be no non-existence to flee to. I mean, that's a philosophical question each person needs to answer for themselves. But I, I want, I want people to think about it that way. And maybe if they're even, you know, ever encountering an individual that's got a, a bad, having a bad run and thinks that all the despair that they're feeling has something to do with the brokenness of their self or the imperfection of the world not understanding that that despair is their greatest teacher and what will guide them to the full unfoldment or a further unfolding because there, no, there is no final unfolding of the self. It is a continual, infinite mm -hmm. process. Yeah, and the suicidal person is another one that is moving from this uncomfortableness in the body. It's perfectly logical to commit suicide if your body is a source of unpleasure. It's not pathological at all. It's normal. It's normal because the suicide that we're talking about now is the extreme where you take your life. Yeah, long before that, people are dead. Emotional plague is deadening in the first place. So half the people you see are suicides, even if they're walking around. Right? So the actual suicide act is like, you know, yeah, before that, you've been bulimic. Before that, you've been pill popping. You know, before that, you've been... Uh, uh, in some way deeply hurt by life and cut off by life and not animated by heroes, hero people, heroic people or heroic films or music. You see, there's something already deadened. That's what emotional plague is. It's a deadening because the very erogenous zones have never been a source of pleasure, thanks to mom, right? And so then there's only nature has ordained it that if something is meant to be a source of pleasure and enjoyment and satisfaction is not. They can only be deadening. They can only be the opposite of that. You think this is one on one, but that's why these medicos are so incompetent, right? Um, 
the the simple fact is that then your body becomes a deep source of unpleasure and there's only certain much that you know certain people can tolerate that now one way to get out of it is to renounce the body like we've been talking about in that gnostic way and then turn to religion or something off world or or even simulations or believing in aliens like you said seeking and, euphoria and, in the collective consensus trance too definitely i mean that. that's something we didn't touch on but one of the most mind blowing things that you helped me realize was that joining the protest, uh, going on the march or whatever the thing is that you, you're jumping in and surrendering your own will to the crowd is a euphoric experience. And I, being someone that doesn't do that, and I've never been drawn to doing that, I've never joined groups or you know, any of that, I identified as an ism or an ist, it just never clicked for me that that is actually where people are deriving the pleasure of their experience from. That's, that's, right. the, that's the real hook that they're addicted to. Uh, we kind of need to wrap up though we're almost to the end of the second hour <laughs> i could uh, there's so much more to, to get into but um uh, i guess i'll let you take this point to wrap up the thoughts of maybe respond to that last statement and see if we can put a bow on this uh wonderful present that we have for all the listeners because this in interview has been phenomenal thank you thank you yeah i mean and i'm going to continue working on this uh there's a series you know we're going to be doing on narcissism soon to really delve deeply into this but we've touched on so many matters here and it is absolutely not just a statement to say that people who are depressed and suicidal and then the ones who go into religion and gnosticism it is a cult of mortification and wilhelm reich is one of the great pillars that can prove it and what we've got to do is make the unusual connection between what we've been saying about your relationship with your body the malignant one and big worldwide philosophies and theologies like Gnosticism. So there's a disconnect, people aren't gonna connect the two. But because of the advent of psychology, you now have the tools that you didn't have prior to 1930. And strangely, you know, that's, that's the very blip in history. So people like myself feel justified then to continue iterating it because, you know, America has always been a very anti-psychological country anyway. And even though, you know, maybe a hundred years has gone by, yeah, it, it's been a hundred years of uh, trying to avoid many psychological insights. So that's just my platform. It's very unpopular, but it's needed. And so out of that, you know, I still think it's because it's benefited me and I've actually seen people be saved from total psychosis by just some of these simple truths, right? That, that's been my living experience. And when you see something that is really, really harmful and so utterly dangerous, right? You're just moved to do something about it spontaneously. You know, and so my experiences in America, California, it, this was the daily experience. I don't know what experience other people were having. I was noticing morning, noon, and night, every second, every minute, waking minute, this, um, you know, thing. And I always found it very interesting that I get there within days and, you know, we're dealing with Gnostic books. So there's something even physically like, wait a minute, this is like my you know entrance into the country. We're having, uh, you know, uh, long, long talks about, the Dead Sea Scrolls and Gnosticism and ancient Jewish mythology or history and all. And it never kind of stopped, you know, because then I found Stefan Holler's book and just dived in there and I found, you know, the, the sort of there's these other iterations of it, like the, the marriage of Christian Rosencrantz, you know, the, there's a lot of uh, other spin off. Uh, like I say, there's a whole Gnostic cults over there. You know, they've got whole sections in bookstores, you know, and it's easy to gravitate toward all of that. And it has hermetic elements within it, you see. And uh, it, it, to me, it was a very, very deep fascination. But it just so happened that because I wasn't drenched in emotional plague or whatever, you know, had plenty of other problems, but not that quite as bad. And uh, I didn't quite become a disciple of it. And in the end, then, reading the Alvin Boy Coons and people, I like started to actually turn against it, you know. So, yeah, it was never a plan. It was never a planned thing. But uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it may be dying. I think the penthouse executive is dead, but the thing turns over by an act of deception. Well, you know, that just emboldens you then to want to break in and show to the world you know, what's happened, kick the door open and say, yeah, this thing is gone for a burden. You know, I think it's very, very important, but also to fill the void because people are so saturated that when they awaken, you know, say they wake up and they go, where am I? What, what's happened? You've been on hypnosis. You want to be able to then set up something to nourish those souls. Self so that they've got something there to nourish by instead of just being left in, in a desert. Yes, selfhood would be that replacement. 
which really all of this mysteria is the replacement for selfhood. Selfhood's the original. (laughs) It is. And it's a very psychosomatic thing. It's not an idea. It's not mysteria. It's an actual process of re-visioning the body, reintroducing yourself to it. It's it's, uh, intelligent. You know, and, and and having a kind of a sensitivity and receptivity, so that when it speaks to you, as it's doing all the time, you're actually listening. That self is a very palpable, very grounded thing. Jung definitely accepted that. Maybe not as much as Wilhelm Reich and the others did, you know. But that's not a fault. He he definitely led up to that. And there's the archetypes are as much of the body. You know, the shadow. I keep talking about shadow work, and in, in that way, that shadow work is nothing more than body language. You know what I mean? Studying the opposite, the schizoid things, you know, Julian James's bicameral mind fix it, fits, fits into this because it deals with trauma, an original trauma that stopped this and brought Gnosticism around. So if you scroll back in history, there was the cataclysms. Gnosticism, so we didn't talk about it, is also born out of a major psychic trauma that caused this disconnect, that caused the left brain or ego to develop over you know, other, other, uh, other types of mentation, which was very so- psychosomatic. How did that voice get suppressed? Because if it was so bloody powerful, then it should be speaking all the time and we wouldn't be having this conversation, right? Yeah, something must have, extraordinary must have happened in order to silence that voice. Well, something extraordinary did. And that is the center of my work, right? The, the effects of trauma. But the trouble is that the traumatized soul cannot address his wound. So it's only until the late 1930s, right, the turn of the millennium back then, that the mind even had the, the wherewithal to turn and say, who am I again? And then we call that psychology. Psychology is so recent. So the healing is recent. We've only made a few baby steps yet. You know, and that's why we need to, like I did that world in the head, world in your head article, because I want to bring the ranks and the Reiches and the Adlers, right? Everybody that's spoken. Um, I'm bringing them all to the table because we're still in very, very early stages. We want to hear from, you know, a uh, uh, Julian James and from, uh, 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 you know, uh, a Karen Hornet. We want to hear all the voices because this is definitely ongoing. And we want to bring in the critics, the Thomas Zazas, the uh, John Paul Sartres who go, you got a lot of problems there. Well, tell us about it, right? Because we want a pure thing. We want, a, we want, we want purity. And so we need these caustic, corrosive voices. We want the detergent to be always put there as well so that some of the dirtier elements, you know, come in because the ego is in charge, remember. And so that will already, you know, throw things off. It's like we talked about in other programs about uh, when a person comes even for a bit of psychology and they're telling about their infancy. I am dealing with their memories of their infancy, not what happened in their infancy. That's the point. Even Freud discovered it, the, the, the displacement, the self-deception, uh, the chicanery that goes on with the mind and the levels of interpretation. You're not getting dreams experience speaking to you directly. You're getting the ego's waking day, uh, waking interpretation of a dream. Oh dear, right? So the psychology tried to bypass that. Freud was always working on ways to try and bypass that sensor, you know, the different, different uh, successes or whatever. But the ego's control is quite deep. It goes quite deep. So you have all sorts of different paradigms, hypnosis, you know, all these different attempts. And then Wilhelm Reich comes on and says, we've got to get rid of the mind altogether. Just give me the body. Lay down. You know, we'll work on your centers. We'll work on your musculature. We can't trust the mind. We can't trust the tongue. It's totally forked. You ne- you've got so many defenses. But the one place you don't have them, or at least where you do have them, there's a different addressing those things, is, is bioenergy. So Reich is the key man then that brought in bio, you know, therapy of the body. I think, the Michael, you'd find it really fascinating, some of the research I've done on Biofield tuning and using tuning forks yes, and sound to work with the um, the biofield anatomy, as it's being called yes. now, is a very new uh, new field. But oh yeah, essentially there's a an architecture to the field around your body, about six feet around one side to the other, and different archetypal energies, if you will, have uh, certain containers in the in this biofield and the the distance it is from the physical core. There, that informs you as to the chronological depth of whatever the trauma is that's stuck really? in the field. And this work is monumental. I don't know if you've uh, seen much of it because it is so recent. Within the last 10 years, practitioners with tuning forks have been mapping out yeah. the biofield yeah. based on. Yeah, yeah I'm it's familiar really, with it. Very interesting stuff and using the, the most essential component of reality, which is sound, 
which is also electricity. People don't understand that sound and electricity are just different parts of the same wavelength of uh, you know, frequency. Yeah, so, I'm a big believer in it. Is re resonance theory, right? You know, there's a guy called Randy Masters I used to know in uh, Aptos, California. He worked with this. Uh, another colleague of mine is very big into this with those tuning, those tuning forks. That would be one of the supreme ways to rebalance yourself and come into harmony, right? The real harmony, which is something that you cannot have mentally. Right? It's bio, it's, bio, uh, it's uh, psychosomatic all the way. And unfortunately, you'd think that with all our modernism, we'd be integrated the body years ago, small demographic maybe, you know, but on the whole, no, the whole Western world has a huge missing part and that's the soma. That's why so many people are grossly overweight, you know, and getting worse. Health has just gone over the cliff, you know, it's really, really bad. And then other disorders it may not be obvious obesity or whatever, but it's a lot of other, you know, diseases are, you know, sugar addictions and all sorts of things, you know, are pertaining to this. But if you come to harmony, and I'm a big believer in these alternative therapies, how can one talk about Reich and Yanov and, you know, Alexander Lowen with art? And, and as I said, this is something that needs to keep unfolding. And I'm glad to see modalities that are taking care of it. There's many. And you just taking care of your body, just factoring it in. Right? But our Western world has only factored it in to the point of like jogging, working out, in, it's infantile. In fact, it can even bring on even worse armoring, you know, because it's wrong thinking again about the nature of the body. You know, so yeah, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and probably we'll have a whole, you know, other other session where we talk about that more in depth. Uh, right now, I just recommend books, you know, and I'd love to know more about this so I can put links below, you know, uh, when I'm talking about this. I like to have the latest modalities because I think they're synthesized better and, you know, they work better. And people have very short time now to heal. You know, they don't have a lot of time in the working day. So, yeah, definitely send me as much information on that as you can, Chance. And I get big thanks for it today as well. It's great to talk about these matters. Yeah, absolutely. We've knows. got a lot left that we can cover together on either one of our shows. So we'll be in touch, especially my pleasure to be continuing to work with you on your premium shows. And uh, so we'll be talking tomorrow for that. A motorcycle just drove by. If you guys could hear that, I don't know. I got a Good. neighbor with a real loud motorcycle. Not always convenient timing. The neighbors but... are loose. Yeah, <laughs> we had one loose earlier today. Yeah, thanks. Because Brotherhood of Death will be up within this week. Uh, you know, so that's going to be thrilling. Yep, followed thanks by Age much. of Dionysus and uh, the Moral Universe. Really oh, fascinating yeah. questions, especially in the latter one. So yeah, we'll we'll speak soon. Everybody, check out Michael's work. Thanks for this conversation, man. It was. Uh, really seminal material for my program in my opinion that's hopefully just people's introduction to these topics sure. and they're ready to go further thanks man oh, yeah. you're welcome all right guys we made it to the end of this one and i'm just going to jump straight into some of the things that uh they got left on the table maybe i had so many quotes pulled out of michael's book just the one book that I'd only read one third of, at least the notes only went up to that point because I knew it was already too much for one show. So I want to get straight in to making a few other points about these topics that I think are important. I guess before I do that, I'll just say this is probably some of the most key content that's ever even been on Interverse, in my opinion. We're talking about collectivism, which is... <laughs> I mean, have you not noticed that that's like the bane of human existence right now? If there's one thing that ever keeps you from doing what you want to do, it's other people's collective thought or, you know, imposes on you. And when we go about our own lives, adhering to collective thought, what we've got ourselves into is psychic self-murder. That's how Michael would put it. And I'm, I'm not kidding, guys. There's so much on his website, Unslaved, that fleshes these topics out. I mean, I don't know how you could be unconvinced that this is an important study, but just look into it more. I think if there were a larger number of individuals that were educated and armed with this, I guess, understanding of collective thinking versus individuated selfhood, we'd be able to help each other a lot more. We'd be able to diagnose what was going on around us much more quickly and cut to the root of the problems. But it's ongoing work. So if you were supporting Michael at unslave.com like I do, you'd be chipping into a good cause. And 
you get so much content out of it. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not just like entertainment. You go into his premium lectures. It's like sitting in on a college course in philosophy, in psychology, in conspiracy, or whatever topic of the day happens to be. And that's not even to mention the really good podcast they do every week. So I'm going to first read this quote from Lao Tzu, which Michael has in his book. This quote just really nails it. Do not go about worshiping deities and religious institutions as the source of the subtle truth. To do so is to place intermediaries between yourself and the divine and to make of yourself a beggar who looks outside for a treasure that is hidden inside his own breast. If you want to worship the Tao, first discover it in your own heart. Then your worship will be meaningful. Now, the Tao is not something we brought up, but if you're unfamiliar with the concept from Taoism, it's basically nature. It's the ongoing flow of ever-changing eternal life force energy that animates all things. And it, it is itself, it is no thing. It has no qualities. It is all qualities. So the Tao is a really amazing study. I'd like to maybe do a whole podcast just on Taoism with Michael because I probably identify as a Taoist too if I had to be an ist or whatever. It's the closest thing. And, you know, that doesn't mean I align with everyone that's ever called themselves a Taoist, but just the idea that there's really nothing to follow except the spirit that animates all life, which is in you. It's really important because that's the religious experience that we would want to seek, not the religious experience of collectivism, which would be, you know, protests, churches, even war. People actually experience euphoria in those situations when you like jettison your own will to join the mass hysteria. There is a type of rush that people get. This is something that Michael's work helped me realize because you can see it in people, but I wasn't making the connection because I don't know how many times I've ever felt that. Maybe like at a big concert in a large crowd when everybody's in the same wavelength, listening to the same band or whatever. That's kind of a, you know, that can be a euphoric rush, but maybe in that case, it is a benign example, P potentially benign, depends on the individual, of course. So it's not like you can't ever you know, mingle into a crowd, but you just never want to give up your actual selfhood, your actual decision-making, your morality. Morality is human generated. And what that means is not that there's no such thing as right and wrong. It's that right and wrong only has any meaning if you give it meaning. And that's a tricky caveat because people would be like, are you saying there's no absolute truth of right and wrong and natural law? And I've used words like natural law before kind of moving away from that because there's no reason to have any kind of dogmatized description of conscience. You have a conscience or you don't, and it's fundamental and foundational. Uh, I'm going to read another quote from Michael. This is one direct quote of his. He says, as a Taoist, I do not concern myself with religious experiences not rooted in the self. This is because communing with the self is a religious experience. It is the beginning of one's spiritual experience, so to speak. I'm not against religious experience because I can well believe in a religion, as long as its church is the self and its high priest reason, one that does not suppress imagination. So, such a good, yeah, such a good quote. Because as soon as you're accepting cosmology from somebody else and philosophy from somebody else and right and wrong from somebody else, doesn't that suppress imagination? And what I mean by that is imagination is actually thinking. Thinking isn't a... a Imagining isn't a type of thinking, I should say. Thinking is a type of imagining. All psychic phenomenon, all mental phenomenon is out of the imagination. So anything that's suppressing imagination, suppressing thinking, it's the same thing. He also says, we can continue living unconsciously by immersing ourselves in the collective abyss or preserve and strengthen our imperial selfhood, realizing that what distinguishes a god should and must distinguish each human being. A yeah, Asher, a yeah. I hope I said that right. I am that I am is what that means. And we've heard guests before say something along those lines, especially Clint Richardson, which is a yeah, really great realization that you're not a noun. You're actually a verb. Uh, you are a process unfolding. That's the Tao. Realizing or understanding the Tao is understanding that you're basically a uh, you know, a process. You're not a thing. You're not a person, place, or a thing. Now, 
I have other things, other things to say, but first let's go ahead and hop over to looking at what was in the plus extension. If you didn't catch the plus extension, oh, that's where the good stuff was. That was when we kicked off the real discussion on Gnosticism. And whatever you think about Gnosticism, whatever you don't know about it or do know about it, we can put all that aside and just look at the actual foundational tenets of it, which is what we tried to do with Michael here, which is to put it really simply that the world is an illusion, the body is a prison, and uh, the reality was created by some lesser God. That's as simple as I can put it. And it's so crazy. <laughs> if you really start, if you give your own thought and imagination to this, it becomes really unbelievable. And it is a tempting belief to jump into, especially when you first start learning about it. You're like, oh, this explains all my problems. It's why life is so hard and why there's evil in the world. But you need to think more deeply about these questions, maybe. Maybe evil is there so that we can learn what we are by experiencing the opposite, for example. So of the things we covered in uh, the second hour about Gnosticism, we talked about whether or not doubting the world exists makes sense or that the world is uh, simulated in a sense or fake. And then that got us into talking about Gnosticism's link to simulation theory, which is a huge interest of mine. I think it's kind of one of my more original research directions, although Michael's had a lot to say about Gnosticism because of what I know about video games and the gamification of society, simulation theory as well. I think I've made some good additions to that conversation overall, especially in the episodes I did on Unslave Podcast. If you go search my name on their website, there's four episodes currently and we'll do more. And there's some of the coolest things I've ever been a part of as far as content creation goes. We talked about the idea of the jailbreaking of reality, the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, we talked about cyberpunk, which is one of the things that was a subject on Unslaved. Cyberpunk, the game that had that crazy transhuman tarot. And the subject in cyberpunk that we discussed was the idea of putting your mind in a simulation, sort of uh, akin to ascending past the demiurge into the true reality if you catch the Gnostic you know, similarity there between digitizing your consciousness and all kinds of ascension programs. Ascension programs are dangerous. They tell you that where you're at and what you are isn't already part of perfection. Uh, we discussed AI algorithms and uh, <laughs> physicists who claim they can prove reality as a simulation. We discussed the definition of simulation, which is hypocrisy, which is collectivism. There's a huge thread there. I'm excited to go back and listen to this one again, honestly. And you know, we also got into archons and archetypes. Jung's take on ecstatic experiences of the self being taken over by numinous forces that feel like they're outside of the ego. And then we talked about proving whether or not God exists, if that's possible, or what an experience of God would be like to an individual. All that and a lot more. Incredible plus extension. I hope you check it out on rockfin.com. R-O-K-F-I-N dot com slash interverse that's my new premium channel you can also do it on patreon that's not going away patreon.com slash interverse but rockfin's a great deal because you get all the other channels on rockfin with the same fee pretty badass and a couple of things that came up in the show too i think this was in the first hour we took we brought up movies like zardoz which is z-a-r-d-o-z -Z, and the television shows from the i think 60s maybe later for Blake seven, Blake seven and the prisoner. Now all three of these are extremely worth the watch. Blake seven maybe isn't as good as you go on, but the uh, concept of like what it means to fight the empire and be a, a rebel and how destructive that can be. And just the, the revolution, if you will, of returning back to where you began, whenever you struggle against the external reality without changing yourself. Great show for that reason but if for nothing else watch the first episode of blake seven where you see the future of the world as the technocrats want it where everyone's living in a bubble world and you can't even go outside and they're all sedated and yeah uh <laughs> check that one out zardoz is an incredible movie too again z-a-r-d-o-z -Z. that one's just wild if you want to see sean connery in a red diaper <laughs> pretty cool movie honestly 
great for being so low budget. And The Prisoner, that's a show that I feel like everyone should watch because it explains collectivism through the experience of this character that's been uh, kidnapped by the government and taken to this weird community to be brainwashed and have information extracted out of him. You might relate to that one a lot <laughs> if you watch it. I recommend all three. Wouldn't have known about those without Michael's podcast. He talked about them in some early episodes, and they're really good. Another point that is a really quick one, but, you know, when it comes to selfhood and the concept of everything being all one, it's a dangerous concept, actually. There's a couple of reasons for that. Um, first of all, if the oneness that you're talking about <laughs> comes from all the pieces coming together to be one, then what happens to the pieces? And if the oneness you're talking about was a primal unity that's been divided into many, well, then it's not really one anymore, in a sense. I mean, you could look at the whole universe as one, but is oneness even a phenomenon that exists in reality? Have you ever seen one of anything? Uh, the more wise, <laughs> like the Taoists, for example, they have a concept of everything coming out of a trinity. The ancient you know, Celtic tribes had the Triskelion or the Triskeli, which is that symbol of like sort of three spirals. And that's one of the things in Michael's book that he breaks down really well is disputing the idea of oneness and of dualism as well, which is what most religious traditions are and worldviews are, are rooted in one of those two things. And uh, getting into the truth of the fact that everything that's generated comes in some sort of sort of triplicate, a mother, father, child type of setup, right? And whenever we get through this, I guess, barrier that we have erected, this glass barrier between us and world, where we say that's world, this is us, and we experience selfhood in all things, it is akin to being both alone and all one simultaneously. And if I say this all the time, but if you look at all one and all alone, it's the same thing, with just one L taken out. <laughs> and we'll talk about what it means to take out an L. That's just think about it. What is an L? So the last thing maybe I want to talk about is uh, some of the refutations of Gnosticism that we didn't even mention maybe, or I just want to recover them real quick. I pulled these out of the presentation on Gnosticism on Michael's premium channel that I just helped him create. I say helped. I just ran the slides. He did all this work and research. Great stuff. And I love it because it jives with what I was, it fits where I was already going. Like, it's not like he's telling me what to think. He's just like providing me all the better ways to say it and showing the evidence from history up to now. But he had one slide in the like 140 slides in this presentation that was just a part one. It was amazing. That were just the glaring contradictions of Gnosticism. So first of all, we're commenting on higher dimensions that no one can possibly know anything about. And if they did, they wouldn't know about it in a way that could be explained or proved to anyone here in an experiential way that would actually constitute firsthand knowledge. Also, what did the Gnostics and early Christians actually know about the natural world that they demonized? If we look at the track record of all these governments and religious or institutions, what have they done for the world? What have they understood about the world? They mostly just consumed it and destroyed it by fire so far, if you haven't noticed. So maybe um, maybe they could have taken a note from the hermetic traditions and seen the perfect harmony in nature that's already there, and then learned from that instead of uh, continuing to feel worse and worse about how traumatized and uh, disconnected they are from source. <laughs> Uh, also, Gnosticism exalts evil far beyond reason. When you think about evil in the world, there's evil and there's good. And there's even neutral. And there's not just one of those things, right? It's all three, the tri triplicate thing again. Gnosticism wants to tell you that the whole world was created by a fallen evil lower god. And so if that's the case, wouldn't it all be evil? And in fact, I guess the only thing that's good is the shred of incarcerated God spirit that is inside all of the living men and women. And so 
in this reality conception, this cosmology, you're really putting evil into way too much power. You're saying everything's evil. It's crazy. Just come on. <laughs> and I know a lot of you maybe have been t tempted by Gnostic ideas. And I hope no one just got like really turned off because like, he's wrong. I know the Archons are real. I know Yaldabaoth is the Demiurge and he Je he's Jehovah and yada yada. So, okay. If that's what you want to think. That's fine. But I'm not here to piss people off about what they've taken in on as religious beliefs. I just want you to see, see these patterns. So we may be, if you agree with me that, yeah, this is unreasonable that we are demonizing nature in the body and exalt, exalting evil and commenting on supernatural mysterium that no one could have any firsthand knowledge about other than personal self knowledge, in which case it's only meant for you anyway. The last question would be though, if there is a lower God that created this whole evil realm, wasn't that God created by the higher God? And why would the higher God allow the lower God to do all this evil to his own self or the fragments of himself that have been trapped? I mean, come on. When does, where does this make any sense? Where's the reason here? Reasons jettisoned, it's fled the scene. Common sense has fled the scene. This is what Michael calls Mysterium. And even the idea of a creation of the universe is pretty unnecessary, in my opinion. It makes more sense to just say, it is what it is. I am what I am. It, will, it always was and always will be. We don't need beginnings and ends. Beginnings and ends is just back to that idea of the oneness. Because no matter how you conceive of the beginning, whether it's a Big Bang or a God, well, what was before that? What created the Big Bang? What created the What created God? And you just go back and back and it's turtles all the way down, as they say. I have no need for this anymore. I mean, I'll use the word the creation, but I don't mean it in that way as uh, like it was manifested out of nothing. I, in a sense, it is. <laughs> if you start to learn about existentialism, you can start to make that argument that everything comes from nothing. But that's a very nuanced conversation, a whole different conversation. And either way, uh, I think that just for there have to have been a nothing, it implies somethingness, right? There has to be something for there to be nothing to be nothing in comparison. Anyway, it makes way more sense to just consider it all as eternal being. Being is being. It never needed to begin. There doesn't have to be only one. And we can move on with our lives and just enjoy being, maybe, and get better at it have more coherence and harmony. That's what I'm about. So I hope you loved this episode. I'm so excited that I'm about to publish this and send it out to the world. One of the coolest conversations I've ever been in and I really respect Michael's work. I mean, you probably caught that drift, but a lot of the great things you've heard me say maybe over the years, if you've been following me for a while, have been influenced by the ways that his work has led me to think. Not the ways, not the things he has told me to think, because in fact, I actually don't agree with all his conclusions across the board. And I would hope he would agree, and I'm sure he would agree, that I shouldn't agree with all his conclusions across the board. Maybe someday I'll take on some of the same conclusions later. Maybe sometime I'll refute some of his conclusions, and it's no love lost. I still look at his work as a monumental stepping stone for my own. And yeah, he's up there with some of the greatest researchers, if the world doesn't totally fall apart, I think hopefully in a, in a just world someday, Michael's work will be remembered on the level of other great philosophers of the past, Kant or Schopenhauer, whoever, name him. I think he's that big of a deal in terms of just how much he has put his life and soul in, let this work be his life. And uh, it's cool. There's, it's just a lot there. You can learn a lot, really good stuff. Uh, psychology is crucial. So yeah, um, hopefully you are going to be able to hear this second hour on Rockfin or you already did. Don't forget rockfin.com slash interverse. Only $10 for all the things on Rockfin or $5 for just my things on Patreon. So pick your flavor. Either is good. And a lot of good people are taking on board with uh, Rockfin now, including Beth Martins, who's coming back soon. Beth is an excellent YouTube video creator and also our old friend Corinne Wilson, a cult priestess. She's gotten herself a Rockfin channel. 
Our family is growing over there, and I hope to just totally take over the place with <laughs> our people, if you will, if we have a type of people. I mean, we're all extremely individualistic, but that's the kind of people I like. So it's not like a collective in a sense. It's a bunch of coherent individuals. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to play us out with, um, you know what we didn't talk about? Michael makes music. He is a classical guitar player and a great one. In fact, getting into listening to his music re reignited my love for guitar music. And I've been super into classical guitar music for a few years. Thanks to first hearing some of his albums. One of my favorites is this dude, Sam Griffin, who makes uh, covers of video game music from my childhood, but with the gu classical guitar. And sometimes like some of those Mario songs on classical guitar, it is crazy what that guy does with his fingers. But Michael Tessarion, look up Imsar Music. I'm going to play a song called Crown of Oberon. You can find it probably on Spotify. I know it's on iTunes Music to buy there, but check out his YouTube. I'll link to that in the show notes, in the episode description, along with all the things we talked about. And that'll be it for now. It's uh, been a really fun week putting this episode together, thinking about all these ideas and reading Michael's book and uh, working with him on his projects. I feel super fortunate that he decided to ask me to do that because it's been a great side gig for me. Not only am I able to get paid for a type of work I love, but I also get to work with an, a researcher I respect. And the project I'm working on is a presentation I'd be watching anyway. So it's pretty awesome. So uh, yeah, check the episode description. You guys are great. I'm, I care a lot about all of you. <laughs> I care a lot about you taking this stuff on board and being on guard for Gnosticism in the world, wherever it rears its head. It is perennial. It comes back. It grows up again after it's been chopped down. When you get to the roots of it, and the roots of it is Mysterium instead of selfhood, personal experience. Mysterium being thinking about ideas or having ideas about ideas that are other people's ideas. You see what I mean here? It's a tunnel of artificiality. It's illusion layered upon illusion and everything, pretty much everything supernatural that you're ever told about is that until you experience it yourself. And in which case it becomes natural. There's no such thing as above or beyond nature. So be wary of all that stuff. I know I've entertained some crazy things in my history, but my discernment is getting better all the time, I think. Okay, I'm supposed to be wrapping this up. You guys are great. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, it's almost a 25 minute outro. What a big show today. Awesome. I love it. All right, catch you guys next week with another extraordinary episode. I can promise you that. Bye bye. <laughs>